I now call to order the meeting of the directors of the New York State Urban Development Corporation doing business as Empire State Development for Thursday, June 25th, 2015. The directors have received the written materials in advance of this meeting and they are free to ask questions at any time. As noted on the agenda posted to the internet, we welcome public comment on the items on the following agenda. To ensure maximum opportunity for participation, speakers representing themselves may speak for up to two minutes each, please, and those representing groups may speak for up to four minutes, one speaker per group. Speakers' comments may address only items considered at today's meeting. Before we begin with the substantive portion of the meeting, I'd like to ask the directors if anyone has any potential conflict of interest with respect to any of the items on the agenda. If so, I'd ask you to please make an appropriate disclosure on the record at this time. We will then be sure that you may recuse yourself from any discussion or vote with regard to such item or items. Any conflicts? Hearing none, thank you. Before calling, um, I'm going to now ask for um, if there are any questions or comments with respect to um, the minutes. I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Um, I'd like to note that uh, Peter Bashar of New York City and Hilda Rosario Escher of Rochester were recently confirmed by the Senate as ESD directors. Mr. Bashar, with the late notice of his uh, being a director, could not make it, but Ms. Escher is here. So welcome. We're Thank glad you. to have you. Also, I want to introduce Mark Silver, who is with us today, uh, representing uh, the state's Department of Financial Services. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yep. Uh, we are going to um, move the agenda slightly out of, out of order. Uh, and I'd now like to call upon Richard Dorado, who will present the Brooklyn Bridge Park Civic and Land Use Improvement Project for your consideration. Thank you, Chairman. Today, the directors will be requested to consider the adoption of a proposed draft modification to the project's modified general project plan for GPP for the purposes of beginning the process for holding a public hearing and soliciting and collecting public testimony and written comment, which will be considered by the directors before taking further action regarding the proposed draft modification. The modification is requested by the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation, or BBP. BBP is a not-for-profit corporation established by the City of New York. The GPP delegates to BBP, subject to the GPP, all obligations and responsibilities with respect to the construction, operation, maintenance, and funding of the park and the adjacent development parcels. The modification concerns the development parcel located on, Pierce, on the Pier 6 uplands. BBP has requested that ESD and its subsidiary, Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation, or the ESD subsidiary, consider the proposed draft modification. BBP requested the modification in accordance with the stipulation and order of settlement for litigation commenced by People for Green Space Foundation. Earlier this week, the ESD subsidiary board met and recommended to the ESD directors that they adopt the proposed draft modification for the purposes of holding a public hearing and soliciting and collecting public testimony and written comment regarding the proposed draft modification. If the directors determine to adopt the draft modification, action on the modification will not be final, will not be final until Action on the modification will not be final until after there has been a there has been published a public notice regarding the proposed draft modification and the date, time, and location of the public hearing on the proposed draft modification. The public hearing has occurred. The public hearing testimony and collected and written comments on the proposed draft modification have been reviewed and considered. 
by the ESD subsidiary and ESD. The subsidiary board has considered such public testimony and comment in a public meeting and taken action and recommended to the ESD directors um, to take appropriate action regarding the proposed modification. The ESD directors have reviewed and considered such public testimony and comment and the recommendation of the subsidiary board and the ESD directors have in a public meeting taken appropriate action regarding the modification. Mm -hmm. Such appropriate action could be withdrawal, affirmation with changes, or affirmation as adopted of the modification. The proposed draft modification concerns the Pier 6 Uplands development parcel. The modification would retain the current GPP authorization for two buildings of up to 315 feet and 155 feet respectively. But instead of prescribing the number of units in each building, retain the maximum aggregate of units for both buildings at 430 units and allow the BBP board to determine within those limits the number and affordability of residential units and other characteristics of the building <coughs> consistent with the technical memorandum dated November 14, excuse me, November 18, 2014, prepared by ESD as lead agency in accordance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Second, it would require that the building heights are inclusive of permanent structures and equipment such as mechanicals, bulkheads, and parapets, and the height will be measured from the flood resistant construction elevation as defined in section 6411 of the New York City zoning resolution. And three, it will amend uh, the GPP with respect to the reference of the secondary loop road that currently exists on the uplands between Pier 5 and 6 and make clear that existence of the road is discretionary for BBP. ESD is the lead agency for the environmental review of the project, certified the project's uh, final environmental impact statement, or FEIS, and adopted findings in accordance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act, or SEEKER when the GPP was first affirmed. ESD and BBP staff and their environmental consultants prepared the technical memorandum that is in the materials distributed to the directors and that is publicly available. The technical memorandum assessed whether the changes set forth in the proposed modification, new information or other changes would result in any significant adverse impacts that were not adequately considered in the FEIS and the secret findings. The technical memorandum analysis concludes that there would be no need for a Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, or SEIS. Therefore, staff recommends that the directors make a determination that no EIS is required in connection with the proposed modification of the GPP. The directors are now requested to, one, adopt the proposed draft modification of the project's modified general project plan for the purposes of holding a public hearing and soliciting uh, and collecting public comment on the proposed draft modification. Two, make a determination that no supplemental environmental impact statement is required in connection with the proposed modification. Three, authorize a public hearing with respect to the proposed draft modification. And four, authorize all actions related to the foregoing. Thank you. Great, thanks. Let, let me start by asking the directors if they have any questions with respect to the presentation of the issue. Okay, we are. Um, we have a number of people who have joined us. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to give you the opportunity to um, make your statements. Comments on this item um, should fall within the guidelines of our time constraints, please. We have a lot of people here. So I'm just going to reiterate, it's uh, two minutes for individual speakers and four minutes for those individuals representing an organization, one representative per group. I'd also like to stress this is not a Q&A session. Don't take that personally. It's an opportunity for you, those of you who wish to make comment, uh, to do so. So Nicole Jordan will call up the individuals who have signed up to make comment. Ms. Jordan will also keep track of the time of those comments. Nicole, please begin. The first speaker is going to be from Senator Daniel Squadron's office, Nishana.
president of Brooklyn Bridge Park Defense Fund. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, my organization is a coalition of 11 long-standing community associations, including the Sierra Club um, of New York. Um, we are asking you to please authorize a new EIS before you undertake the modified GPP. There have been seismic changes to this project area that demand this. We no longer have a hospital in the area supporting our, our residents. That was unplanned and unstudied in 2005. The fastest trip to the hospital in a race officiated by Mayor de Blasio himself as public advocate in 2013 when Litch was closed, clocked in at 19 minutes. That was the best time, 19 minutes to the hospital. Where's the current, where in the current EIS does it say that an urgent care center is a sufficient replacement for a full service hospital? A hospital that served 300,000 people, which is close to the population of Buffalo, um, not to mention the tens of thousands of people who are coming even before these Pier 6 towers are built. There are 12,500 new apartments in the pipeline even before the Atlantic Yards towers go up, and they were not studied, were not planned in 2005. <coughs> Additional, a thousand or more apartments will go up 425 feet from this project um, at the former Ledge Hospital site, also unstudied 10 years ago. No new transit is planned. In fact, in 2012, the city removed the B-77 bus that's that supported this area, among others. Next month, an RFP will be issued for the BQE reconstruction. That is a huge project. And two engineering firms and the former city councilman in this area have also have alerted the community to this RFP uh, bid. Where will the 182,000 cars per day be redirected? Where will they stage the construction materials? Almost every roadway in the area, technically, is at or over capacity. 78 parking spaces for the Pier 6 buildings is inadequate. Where in your equation have you factored in the two garages that were used in the former EIS for this park going to be housing, which they are in the plans of being? Even though many of us contemplated these impacts and testified over the probability for many years, our expertise and knowledge has been ignored. Not in not implementing an EIS is a betrayal of the public's trust. We hold you each individually responsible for this. Our schools are overcrowded today. Accepting Litch Skyscraper District for one school doesn't even begin to meet the needs of those very people who are going to live in that footprint, let alone the people who are now going to speak later about the impacts for them, for their children that live here today. If you're concerned about making sure the park is funded in 50 years, where is your plan for more park lands that are required for the people that are coming to Brooklyn today before these new buildings are built? Show us your 50-year plan for park lands. Isn't it worthy that we start planning for parks for the next 50 years as opposed to just the financing? Isn't the three acres you could save today for the people of Brooklyn, for needed park lands in the in a borough that is the least parked borough per capita in all of New York City. And New York City is the least parked city in all of America. So what does that say to you? There are no new sewage plants. When it rains, Dumbo basements fill up today. So what is going to happen with these thousand, well, these new people? What improvements have you made to the grid? I won't go through. It's well documented, all of the manhole covers that are, are popping up. <clears throat> I think I have four minutes. So. I haven't even touched upon Sandy and your sea rise no plan plan. One citizen remarked, and, and hopefully he will talk about it today, about really the hypocrisy of not planning for, for other superstorms, let alone a hurricane. If this were simply a matter of rubber stamping a doctrine that you guys have over the years endorsed of alienating parklands for private housing, only a, only a handful of us park advocates like myself would probably care. But this really is about deceit. This is about building a park, saying you needed the funds, and when they were no longer needed, fabricating new expenses to continue the charade, and then grafting the issue of affordability onto that story. I believe this is a spectacular exercise in hubris, deflection, and deception. You mentioned, sir, that the ESD reviewed and considered comments. I was at that meeting on Tuesday, if that's what you were referring to. 50 good citizens came out, about a dozen spoke. You have no concept that we had one day notice, one business day notice, to change all of our, our plans, to spend the weekend fine-tuning our testimony, to bring it down to the required two minutes, and then 
Immediately after the testimony, there was no discussion of all that had gone before, not one word. And then when I had the nerve to raise my hand and say, number one, two directors should have recused themselves. Two directors who own property in this footprint and didn't recuse themselves. The chair did, thank goodness. But I was then chastised for having the wrong tone. What do you feel that these people who come out and spend their business day talking to you, hoping for engagement, hoping to hear your thoughts on why you want to push through this modified GPP without doing your due diligence in terms of an EIS? How do you think they feel? They have, these are good, good people who have, who want your engagement and who have asked for your engagement for a decade and you are ignoring them. Shame on you. And when in 50 years they turn and they look at this park and they say, how could these people have ruined the view of the Great Bridge for, for Brooklyn Ads? How could they have accepted these towers that block the entrance to the great park that we have advocated for three, 30 years for? Shame on you. And your names will be on that. Henry Richmond, Director of People for Green Space. My name is Henry Richmond, the Director for People for Green Space. We are sympathetic to the need for affordable housing. However, this is a public park for everyone and about a fundamental commitment to minimize development in this park. First, the proposed modification is inconsistent with the MGPP, which established the parameters of the park structure and the UDCA standards for land use improvement and civic projects. BBPDC has long committed to minimize park development. In her June 2006 affidavit in the BBP Defense Fund case, then President Wendy Leventer specifically promised the court that, as is explicitly stated in the GPP, BBPDC has committed to building the minimum development necessary to cover the park's maintenance and operations needs. If requests for proposals are issued, for the development component, it becomes clear that market conditions will allow for less development to support the park's needs. The development program will be reduced accordingly. If the BBP can forego millions of dollars in revenue by including affordable housing in the Pier 6 development, then the scope of the development can and should be reduced. Look at the January 2006 MGPP, which is attached to the 2010 Master Ground Lease with the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation. Building envelopes described represent the maximum build-out within the project, with the intention being to build only what is necessary to support annual maintenance and operations. While a noble aim, foregoing revenue to add affordable housing is inconsistent with the MGPP and the BBP DC's longstanding commitment to minimize development in this park. Further, the purpose and need of the project in the MGPP talks about greater availability of publicly accessible recreational open space, remarkable use, and inclusion of appropriate commercial uses to support annual maintenance and operations. Affordable housing does not generate funds to support the park and is therefore inconsistent with the MGPP. By taking away public park space and by blocking the remarkable views when the public enters the park, the unnecessary affordable component is inconsistent with the MGPP for this park. Second, if the BBP can forego millions of dollars in revenue by including affordable housing in the Pier 6 development, this is a substantial change in circumstances and constitutes newly discovered information since the 2005 FEIS issued more than a decade ago. Such that the park's finances must be reevaluated in a SEIS to determine the necessity for the development of the Pier 6. The original analysis had a 2012 build date. Now the project is expected in 2019. Park real estate prices have already increased from 750 a square foot in the 2005 FEIS to almost $2,000 a square foot. This is an incredible change in circumstances and that warrants a supplemental EIS. Third, why is the ESD considering adopting a tech memo that the city created for litigation purposes that minimizes important issues like climate change? The 816 8614 board meeting minutes for the BBPC note that BBP staff and BBP's environmental consultants would undertake an analysis of the potential environmental impacts. But the ESD is supposed to be the lead agency under SECRA, and before this week, the BBP DC board had not even met in years. Fourth, why was no financial analysis and study of reduced NC alternatives in the November tech memorandum? The, the authoring firm, AKRF, previously argued in court about the importance of this financial analysis and environmental reviews for the Spark C affidavit of AKRF's Edward Applebaum in the 2006 BBP defense fund case. Historically, financial analysis of the proposed project changes as well as alternatives have been included in environmental reviews for the Spark, for instance, the Appendix C of the 2005 FEIS or the January 2006 secret findings. Current market data is important given the commitment to minimize development if market conditions permitted, as noted on page 16 of of the January 2006 secret findings. As the November tech memo does not include financial analysis, a SEIS is needed to both show the park is self-sustaining with the proposed changes, including foregoing millions of dollars in revenue by adding the affordable component, and two, whether current market conditions would permit the reduction in the Pier 6 development. On the latter part, as the affordable 
quote it roughly, one third of the proposed development does not generate revenue for the park. It's clear that park development could be reduced by one third, thereby helping to mitigate the tremendous school overcrowding and other environmental issues created by the project. The supplemental EIS that includes park finances and reduced density alternatives is clearly warranted given the dramatic change in the park finances financial and other circumstances. In conclusion, we urge the DVPDC to reject the proposed modification as is inconsistent with the MGPP and to require a supplemental EIS as warranted by the significant environmental impacts from both the proposed changes as well as the changed circumstances since the 2005 FEIS. And with respect to the adopting the tech memo, I mean, it's outrageous to make that vote before the public hearings that are going to talk about these dramatic changes. That was the purpose of the settlement, and they're trying to put the cart before the horse once again. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Steve Halk. I'm a resident of Brooklyn. Superstorm Sandy was an unprecedented environmental event that invalidated old assumptions like those underlying the FEIS issued seven years earlier. But don't take my word for it. Governor Cuomo, to his credit, repeatedly has emphasized the game-changing aspects of Sandy. Within weeks of Sandy, Governor Cuomo proclaimed in a daily news op-ed, extreme weather is the new normal. In a press release issued on October 29, 2014, he stated, Superstorm Sandy demonstrated that New York, as we know it, faces a different reality, a reality of increasingly frequent extreme weather events that cannot be ignored. And in January 2013, speaking about areas flooded by Sandy, like the site where these two huge buildings will be erected, he told the Daily News editorial board, at one point we have to say, maybe Mother Nature doesn't want you here. Maybe she's trying to tell you something. I wish you could do this Queen's accent, but I can't. <laughs> As we all know, the governor is a man of considerable influence and persuasive powers, and not just with you folks whom he's appointed. Um, just months ago, for example, he rejected the mayor's plan to build 11,000 units of affordable housing in Sunnyside, Queens, because he didn't think it should be located in uh, railroad yards there. Surely, unique, beautiful parkland at the entrance to New York Harbor and a mandatory evacuation flood zone is even more deserving of his and your protection. New Yorkers have a right to expect the governor not just to talk the environmental talk, but to walk it. As his appointees, don't make his words ring hollow. Use your authority to insist that the FEIS be updated to reflect the many significant changes in the 10 years since it was issued, especially those that the governor rightly has described as the new normal and a different reality, and make certain that any construction in the park is kept to the absolute minimum necessary to support its proven legitimate financial needs. Thank you very much. My name is Zoltan Enkovsky. I have lived in Brooklyn Heights for 21 years. I will focus my comments on traffic issues in the area adjacent to Pier 6 to underline why a new EIS is necessary. I have lived in the immediate area near Pier 6 since 2009 and have seen huge increase in the traffic flow. The BQE has four entrance and exit ramps at Atlantic Avenue, Columbia Streets, and at rush hour, traffic in both directions is always at a standstill. Motorists attempt to avoid this traffic by using the adjacent narrow residential streets of Hicks, Furman, and Columbia, making traffic at the Atlantic Avenue BQ interchange a nightmare and dangerous for both pedestrians and cars. To give you an example, the westbound traffic on Atlantic Avenue heading towards Pier 6 and the Port Authority Brooklyn Marine Terminal is two lanes. At Hicks Street and Atlantic Avenue, where, by the way, Rich is located, and will be redeveloped into huge residential and commercial space, adding more traffic, Atlantic Avenue must accommodate left-hand turns from Hicks Street and the normal westward traffic, including two city bus lines, the 61 and 63. One of these two lanes is, at this point is reserved for the entrance ramp to the BQE, so you have only one lane left for all the traffic going to the marine terminal and to the park and going left to Columbia Street and going right to Furman Street. The 2014 technical memorandum only dealt with the potential additional traffic the 430 units at Pier 6 would create, deeming it negligible, and wholly ignored the horrific current traffic conditions. This is akin to ignoring PSA's current overcrowding 
by saying an additional 50 students is negligible. I urge you to carefully consider all the changes since the 2005 FEIS and wait to make a decision on construction on Pier 6 until a new EIS is available. Thank you. Todd Castillo, New York City Public School 8. <coughs> My name, is, uh, <clears throat> my name is Todd Castillo. I am a parent of a student at New York City Public School 8, and I'm now in my fifth year as a member of the PTA board. As a reminder, PS8, the public school that the kids from the Pier 6 development would attend if this project proceeds. And all the te although the technical memo relies on lots of facts and figures about the overall school district 13 and some legalistically concocted entity called Subdistrict 2, something which only city planners must know about, the reality and fact of the matter is that PS8, not District 13, not Subdistrict 2, but PS8 is a school serving Pier 6 and all of Brooklyn Heights. In 2005, when the final environmental impact study was completed, it reported that PS8 was at only 66% capacity and actually had excess seats available. Fast forward to last spring, the principal, along with the Department of Education, was forced to make the very difficult decision of entirely abandoning the existing pre-K program at PS8 because the school had become too overcrowded and they didn't want to force, they didn't want to be forced to turn away new kindergarten students. Now the irony of this situation shouldn't be lost on any of you because as I'm certain you know, Mayor de Blasio made universal pre-K a cornerstone of his campaign. After eliminating the pre-K program, the school still remains overcrowded. According to the DOE's own guidelines, the school 40% capacity. Again, this is more than a year ago. No more excess seats Where is by the FDF, but rather an acute shortage and excessive overcrowding. Now, two months ago, in planning for the next year's school year, 50 families in the PS8 school zone were officially informed by the DOE that their children cannot attend PS8 as kindergartners because the school has become even more overcrowded. Some of these people bought homes in the neighborhood for their kids to attend the local school. Oh, the, and Georgetown. To be sure, school overcrowding is a problem across all of New York City, but PS8 in particular is one of the most overcrowded schools in the entire city. And just look at the development being planned with absolute disregard for what it means to the school and the community. This school overcrowding problem can be traced almost directly to residential overdevelopment and near zero planning about the impact on local schools. Pier 6, like other projects, would only exacerbate the problem and do nothing to alleviate it. According to the DOE's own official numbers, Pier 6 alone would add another 125 elementary students to the local school. We just turned away 50 students this year. When Pier 6 is done, we turn away 175? Which family's kids will attend the local school and which won't? Like this year, it will be a lottery. And some family that lived, that's lived across the street from PS8 for a decade will be out of luck just because we've crammed another 125 kids into the school zone. So the existing environmental study says the school is at 66% capacity, and as of last year, and the reality of the matter is the school is at 140% capacity and growing rapidly. This yawning disparity alone, by itself, never mind all the other factors which will be discussed today, is enough to require another environmental study. 140% capacity. Think about what that means for a child's education. Now think about what that means if there were a fire or some other kind of incident in that school. And think whether it makes just a little bit of sense to step back and consider the current situation regarding our schools. So as public servants, do the right thing and do another study. Jeffrey Smith. My name is Jeffrey Smith. As you know, I'm a resident of Brooklyn Heights. I come to you today to once again plead that you stop, look, listen, and seriously consider this moment that you are at, and you're at. You know, in the many years that I've known business people and other financial interests in New York State, how many of them have taken their businesses and have taken their work and taken everything out of New York State. And in speaking to them over the last maybe 40 year period, 
it's always the same. It's not the taxes. It's not the uh, deteriorating infrastructure. It's not any of that. It's the hopelessness in dealing with Albany and the hopelessness of dealing with the city and state. It's the feeling that it's not an open process. And whatever they say, no matter how logical and reasonable like these people are saying, it's going to pull on deaf ears. Look, that's why people feel that Albany and this city has become an extension of Bilderberg, where it's a closed, locked group of people who are making policy virtually extra-governmentally, and there isn't any outside input. Well, what do you think that does? I'll tell you what it does. It drives the most intelligent, most valuable people out of this state. Yes, that's what it does. And that's what's happening here. You need to listen to outside voices. They're trying to put a Palisades Park on my, my doorstep. Remember what happened to a Palisades Park? I do. The crowds, the disruptions. I was there. You weren't there? Oh, yes, you are. You've just been beamed back. We've all been forcibly beamed back. This is a disastrous making, but most of all, it makes people feel that this is a closed process that nobody has input into. Guess what that does to people in this state? Thank you. Jonathan Holman? Um, I'm a long-term resident of Brooklyn Heights. I note the name of this, or group is the New York State Urban Development Corporation. A good name because you're developing the most spectacular urban landscape in the world. Um, it's, excess, it's a narrow park, uh, it's an island cut off from the rest of Brooklyn by the BQE. There are only two bridges into the park. Uh, the main one is Atlantic Avenue, um, Pier 6. There's already 2.2 million square feet of housing at the base of Atlantic and with the proposed lift just at the other side of the BQE. So you are effectively blocking the entrance to this grand urban landscape and commensurate with your name, rather than be the New York State Urban Development Mistakes Corporation, you really should take a very careful look at the geography and what's going on here. Thank you. Martin Hale, Save Pier 6. Good morning, I'm Martin Hale and I represent uh, Save Pier 6. We have about 5,000 signatures on uh, social media and a petition pleading for more park space. And, um, you know, just, just to start, uh, there's a great uh, polar explorer, Apsi Cherry Garrard, Garrard, and he said, the wise man knows what a truly awful thing it is to govern. We recognize that you have a lot of uh, different constituencies. I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, it's just very, very important that you actually listen to what is said today and I, I humbly request that you actually discuss and debate it. On Monday, many, many people took time off from work to give their input, yet there was no discussion at all. And again, we're dealing with a situation in Albany where, where there's been a big scandal, everyone knows about it. Uh, you know, the real estate interests have, have, have been uh, you know, uh, influencing a lot of our elected officials. And to not even have discussion when we're dealing with a major real estate development that's taking away parkland in perpetuity, it just feeds this, this terrible public perception of, of our government. And, and yes, it is a, wide, a, a, a terrible and tough thing to govern, but don't compound that issue. Please discuss what we're talking about this morning. I just want you to consider a couple of very specific issues. One, a, a, a supplemental EIS truly should be required here. If you dig into the issue, you'll see the assumptions have changed dramatically. You'll see the tech memo was done by the city rather than by the state. Representing the state, I really think you're going to find when you dig into the legal issues with your general counsel, which I hope you'll do, you probably need a state-led tech memo. If I were a board member, I would seriously discuss that. Um, second, we've clearly had some very major changes in the, in, the, um, in the area. How many of you have kids? If you just raise your hand, kids, kids? Come on, guys. Anyone here have kids? No kids? No? Don't even want to raise your hands? Do you take them to parks? You know, this is, um, our park space is getting ever more crowded and ever more scarce with the massive, massive development in Brooklyn. I'd suggest that a supplemental EIS or a tech memo should truly address the broader context of development, the broader context of school capacity, and, and that, um, and keep in mind that 
there was a public commitment by our elected officials to minimize housing in the park. Going back on that commitment should be a really, really big deal, right? Because uh, um, the whole community expected that. So I'm going to wrap this up. But in summary, we got about 5,000 signatures of, of people, and it transcends just you know the people who live right next door. It's really people who love parks, use parks. It's people who are not happy with the influence of real estate on, on government. Please consider this. Thank you very much. Rafael Bodon. I'm Roy Gadoni, a resident of Brooklyn Heights. And considering the two minute limit, I just want to talk about one, one area why an updated environmental impact study is so critical. The proposed project changes and the dramatic changes in physical conditions in the neighboring areas since the 2005 final EIS require an updated or supplemental EIS. Increases in residence, residential building in downtown Brooklyn Brooklyn Heights, Dumbo, and the proposed Litch development in Cobbleville all lead to a need, needed uh, increase in services in police, fire, traffic control, schools, and a variety of other items. The popularity of the One Brooklyn Bridge Park leads to a large visitor population, especially on weekends, and therefore to more required services. In addition to providing expanded services, we must consider the effects imposed upon the development requirements by using parkland, which is in a flood zone, and the probability of having another hurricane like Sandy. All these factors need to be considered in evaluating the impact of what has been and what is planned to be constructed in the park in the neighboring areas. The previous EIS is approximately 10 years old, and its basis assumptions and projections do not meet the current conditions. With all the changes in project conditions and timing, how can the existing EIS be used to project future needs and problems? Some personal comments. As a person trained in science, I can't understand why anyone would object to performing a new EIS and obtaining data more consistent with the vast changes that have occurred over the last 10 years. I would think an EIS is the kind of document that should come with a caution on it, best diffused by a certain date. And that date shouldn't be 10 years in the future. I'm not claiming this is a novel idea, because we do this for law, uh, local law 11 and other regulations that must be updated periodically. I urge you to consider an updated EIS. Thank you. Alex Sash. Good morning, folks. Um, this doesn't make any sense at all, building these buildings. You've heard from everyone here. We have major school overcrowdedness. We don't have a hospital. Um, traffic and security are major issues. Uh, we're in a floodplain. I mean, every fact just stacks up against common sense. So I don't really know what is leading everybody to ignore what's really at stake here. Is it financial? Is it the fact that nobody wants to go through with a new EIS? Is it that? Uh, people don't want to revisit a decision that was made over 10 years ago. It just doesn't make sense to do this at all, especially when something is permanent. So I urge you, please, to really reconsider this. And I understand that a lot of these things just kind of get passed through. Um, really think about this. Um, it really impacts the future of our community, our neighborhood, our parkland, our children, and our safety. And given um, Hurricane Sandy and the fact that you know, the reality is in, and we, we live in a world now where this is going to probably happen again. It, I lived down there at the time when Sandy hit, and it was, it was a scary moment for all of us, and it's going to happen again. Why would you want to put these two monstrosities right in the floodplain? We live in a beautiful city. There are five boroughs. Spread it out. Get out there and, I mean, hit the rest of Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens. Why build right into the same spot where everybody wants to go? And the fact is, is that you have people coming from all over the world and all over from Brooklyn who are enjoying this park. It, it already is so overcrowded. So I urge you, please, think about it. Don't just pass it through legislation and uh, really give it a second thought. Thank you so much. Anthony Manheim, campaign for Brooklyn Bridge Park.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to focus my comments on process because that's what I believe we're doing here. I apologize for not addressing the acting chair by name, but he failed to identify himself, so I don't even know who he is. Um, my understanding from the comments that were made at the beginning of this uh, hearing, of this board meeting, is that you are intending to vote now on whether an EIS, a supplemental EIS, is required or not before you've had the hearing, the public comment, some of which uh, uh, has been alluded to by other speakers this morning, which I uh, said to myself, it seems to me that's entirely inappropriate and backwards. Even such things as your agenda item, which lists the location of Brooklyn Bridge Park, as in Kings County, is incorrect and misleading. The centrality of this park at the heart of New York City is underscored by the fact that it straddles the New York County, Kings County line. The projecting piers are in Manhattan. The county line is at the bulkhead on the Brooklyn side. If you don't even know that, if you can't even get an agenda straight, I don't see how you can responsibly make a decision about whether or not, more than 10 years after the fact, a new environmental impact statement is called for. Five, over 5 million square feet of, of developer off the tax rolls properties of the, uh, owned by Jehovah's Witnesses and Long Island College Hospital have become, uh, on the market, available and very likely to become residential buildings since the EIS was written. That's, that's four, four, five million originally of the Jehovah's Witnesses, of which one million is the Brooklyn, uh, one Brooklyn Bridge Park um, uh, complex, it's already there, and the other four million, including a million that they have as of right to build, is some of which is right along, <coughs> right across the street from the park that says Watchtower on it. The two to three million square feet of, uh, uh, Brook, of uh, Long Island College <coughs> Hospital properties also were off the tax rolls and will become under tax rolls. There will be huge opportunities for more affordable or other kinds of housing to be built, which was not contemplated when the EIS was written 10 years ago, nor was super soaring standing, nor was the turnover of operating control of this project from the state, which owned two-thirds of the lands in the Pier 1 to 6 area at least, and the city, which was the junior partner, to effective control by the city, which really raises the question of whether not only is a new EIS, a supplemental state EIS called for, but whether they shouldn't be being undergoing a review under the city's uniform land use review or ULERP procedures. Uh, there are so many other things that have changed in the last 10 years that to vote before you've heard the evidence that no updated environmental impact statement is called for by building 50% more housing than the city with its own, we believe, grossly overstated uh, or misstated financials indicates is necessary to support the park, when not a penny, by the way, of the revenues from this supports uh, is new revenues coming to the city. It's a diversion of pilots, payments in lieu of taxes that come to the, that would have otherwise gone to support the city. And the only money that comes to the city that's new is that which comes from selling the parkland, the upfront payments. It's a preposterous financing financial plan made triply more preposterous by the events that have occurred since the EIS was written. It really needs to be studied before it's voted on. Thank you. Patrick Kalaki, Brooklyn Heights Association. Good morning. Uh, I'm actually uh, Tony's successor from 30 years ago, and uh, uh, he referred to, you know, talked about process, but uh, he started, he was one of the originators who worked on the park to, uh, to, to get us to where we are today. And, uh, and that was ba based on public agreements, which are foundational and, of course, sacred to us, and really sacred to the public process uh, of trust and decision-making. Um, I am the uh, president, so I'm, I'm currently the president of the, uh, the new president of the Brooklyn Heights Association, and I'm here speaking for the board and advocating on behalf of the community. Um, and we do understand, as Yishan pointed out, that this is a, uh, a start of a process but the, the adoption of the tech memo sort of changes that significantly. Um, so we, 
because that, that is a significant decision, not just going into a process. Um, so we respectfully request that you not approve the Park Corporation's proposed modification of the GPP uh, because you simply lack su sufficient information. You're not prepared to make that decision yet. Um, the Park's general project plan, which, was, which received formal approval by this body in 2006, permitted only as much housing as necessary to support Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and this was affirmed and discussed in a 2005 Brooklyn Bridge Legal Defense Fund case uh, where Judge, Judge Michael wrote, respondents also noted that the GPP represents the maximum build out within the project. And if market conditions allow for less development to support the park's needs, the development would be reduced accordingly. Uh, the facts of 2015 call this uh, into question the economic necessity. Life, life has changed since 2006. Um, and yet, through the language of the proposed modification, you're being asked to approve an action that allows the park to proceed with the maximum build-out. A yes vote on the modification will empower BBPC to build these two huge towers, even if not one cent is, is required. Public hearings, even those uh, agreed to through the, through the case with uh, people for green space, uh, cannot replace an obligation to respect and maintain such, public, such fundamental public agreements. Um, the written materials accompanying the modification request two significant, uh, contain two significant omissions. First, they do not inform you that you are violating these agreements and the, the judge's decision. <clears throat> and second, they do not provide you with the financial information required to make the decision. So again, you, you, we, don't know, we don't know where the numbers are. Um, and at, at this time, BBPC has uh, uh, contracted with an independent financial analyst to evaluate the, uh, the financial status of the park. So again, it's strange to be making this decision in advance of that. Um, we also believe that the technical memorandum, again, as I said, uh, presented was flawed because it fails to consider alternatives that have been made much more viable since 2005. And this doesn't even consider any of the various issues, schools, the flood zone, all the various issues that have changed so drastically in our, in our, in our community since 2005. So we urge you to take the following steps before even considering any modification of the GPP. Uh, wait for the uh, independent financial analyst. Compare the revenues uh, from the Pier House and, uh, and Empire Stores developments, two of the major developments. Compare them, what we currently know, to what was expected in 2005. Explore BPPC's uh, sequencing, how, what they're planning to do in terms of sequencing cap capital expenditures front-loading, tremendous amounts of expenses to essentially create a deficit, um, and considering whether, consider whether borrowing is a reasonable approach uh, to smooth out cash flow, require, flow requirements so that a permanent decision, a permanent impact on our community is not imposed on us for a short-term need. Um, so uh, one more comment. There are those who would consider us to be uh, taking a NIMBY position, that we do not want affordable housing. However, we've, we've had this position since the start of the park in 2005, and affordable housing is certainly an, a critical and laudable goal, and a very important goal to, to all of us. Um, but so are good schools, good hospitals, good transportation systems, and of course, good parks, of which Brooklyn Bridge Park is one of them, and we want to make it a better park. Thank you very much. Nate Rubin, Atlantic Avenue, LDC. Hi, I'm Matt Rubin, Matt Rubin, uh, the Atlantic Avenue LDC. I also am on the board of the Atlantic Avenue Bid. Uh, I'm a landlord on uh, Hicks and Atlantic, the, the traffic snarl that Sultan was talking about, uh, and I have a business there, and I'm a long-term uh, lifelong resident. Uh, I've been watching these uh, here since I was a child, where there were actually boats there, uh, and I've heard about the project. Um, for, uh, you know, since the 1980s. And uh, what I want to talk, uh, what I'm here to talk today about is about the park and what uh, we need for the park. Um, th this is a park. Um, it was uh, bought to build an iconic park to prevent development, to prevent somebody else buying it and, and building uh, developments there in the, in the 1980s. That's, that's why it was uh, but that was the original uh, intention. Uh, this park and all open spaces, uh, they're integral ele elements of building a living, livable community. 
it's important to brooklyn it's important to new york uh it's important to the whole country and the world this is an iconic uh piece of land um, it's not supposed to be a money-making endeavor and it's supposed to be something you know that's invested in for the greater good uh, from Atlantic Avenue's standpoint, uh, we need this entrance to be awe-inspired. Um, I was reading a New York uh, Times Sunday Review article a few weeks ago about how awe experienced in groups is what brings people together in a community. Um, the goosebumps that we all get from a musical performance, from a fireworks show, from a winning basket, a uh, sunset on a lawn, a child playing in a fountain in the middle of a plaza. These are the things that make life sacrifice, compromise, worthwhile in this crazy city. I mean, just getting out of Grand Central, packed into a subway, uh, if every building was built to the max, I wouldn't be a happy camper, you know? But, but there are things. There's the Grand Central Terminal. There's, um, you know, beautiful architecture. These are the things that make it worthwhile. These are the things that um, I think you're supposed to be doing, all inspiring development. Um, uh, yes, you, you, um, this public open space is one of the things that holds the city together. It doesn't seem to be valued um, by our local administration. If you've been down to the park on the weekend, it's not a playground for the rich. Uh, it doesn't need to be taken down a notch. It's not a laboratory to launch experiments like waterfront development, affordable housing. We need to keep it on track for what it needs to be, for what it was originally purchased for. Um, there's no need to rush to do it for political expediency, for fear of a market bubble. Um, it's uh, every square inch of the park is needed. I mean, if you've been down there, uh, it's a great park. I love the park. Regina, you guys, I love the park. I'll be at the pop-up pool later today. Um, but every square inch is needed. If you look at the square footage of that space, you can imagine, you know, another pop-up pool. You can imagine another volleyball court. You can imagine a million different things that are needed there. Every square inch is used. Every square inch is beautifully designed. And we, we just need more of it. There's no reason to have less of it. There's some kind of compromise or some kind of way to do it better. And we should be trying to do it better. You guys should be pushing to do it as great as it can be done, not, not just good enough. Um, it's not an unsolvable financial puzzle. Uh, that's really your expertise, other people's expertise and mine, but I think we can all figure that out. It's not the 1980s. There's money out there. There's development out there. There's, you know, there's ways to do it. Um, I just want to encourage you to uh, build goosebumps. Build goosebumps out there. Don't look at building buildings. We got other people to do that. Um, and the last thing is, we don't want to look back. Somebody said this before, but we don't want to look back and shake our heads. People are already shaking their heads about Pier 1. We don't want to have another mistake. Um, let's take our time. Let's do it right. Arthur Floor? Yes. Pass? OK. So then our final speaker will be Louise Matthews. New, new, uh, excuse me, new face at the table. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Louise Matthews. I'm a resident of Brooklyn Heights. I've been a resident for the last four years. Interestingly enough, I was one of the first consultants in 1997 who was, was hired by the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation to actually uh, prepare an economic viability study. So I'm happy to say that you know, 15, 16 years later, the, the park has been built. It's an absolutely resounding success and, and has you know, exceeded any, any projections that we had in our study back in 1997. Interestingly enough, in 1997, I was on the board of Habitat for Humanity. And where the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation office is now, Habitat had their warehouse. So it was really. Back in those days, it was the, the back of beyond. So I'm here this morning, actually, to support all the, the testimony of those who have spoken before me, that the world really has changed since 1997. The GPP has been modified. In 1997, there was no housing anticipated in, in the plan. It, the GPP has been modified to include housing, but as, as many of the 
speakers have said, the housing in the GPP was only to substantiate the whatever operating budget is necessary to maintain the park. So it's the, the whatever housing should be built or if it's built should really minimize, it should, should be minimized and only should be built to fund the park. Secondly, as, as everyone has stated this morning, the world has changed dramatically and, and I'm a full supporter of updating the EIS. We need to really review the infrastructure, whether it's the roads, the schools, 140 percent um, overcrowding at, uh, at uh, PS8. And third, in terms of the, the height of the buildings, I'd really like the Park Corporation uh, to really consider the, the height of the buildings and not marring the beautiful landscape for generations to come. Thank you. Um, Liz, I don't know if maybe you can just remind the directors of where we are in the process in terms of, you know, what brought us to this moment, what subsequent events might be, be some, something about the role of the city and the state here, so we can have the context of that again. Absolutely, and Richard, you can jump in and help me, but basically this uh, was a DC project in 2005. This was a project that uh, ESD UDC had back in 2005-2006 and we uh, created the general project plan and still on the general project plan and resulted from a uh, transfer of property from the Port Authority uh, to the city, to the state, and a consolidation with city property. And in 2009, I think it was that we turned the project over to the city. And it is now a, uh, based on an agreement between ESD and the city, a city managed project. And uh, Regina Myers is the president of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation and director, president of the park. And we defer to the city to make the decisions about how to develop and advance the park and maintain the finances and manage the finances for the park. Uh, there was litigation involving Pier 6 after the city issued an RFP and the case was settled. Uh, about two months ago, and the settlement provided for uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation to consider and for ESD to consider a modification to the general project plan. The modification does basically three things. It, number one, uh, reduces the envelope for the buildings that would go up on Pier 6 so that the mechanicals on the building would be included within the envelope of the building. It secondly allows, defers to the city's Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation any decisions about what the content of those buildings would be, whether they will include affordable housing, community facilities, and how many units will be allocated between the two buildings. And the third thing it does is it moves a road <coughs> allows for the movement of a road outside the building. The decisions about whether to build the buildings, whether there will be affordable housing, whether there will be community facilities in the buildings, are all to be made by the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation, consistent with our agreement with the city that this is a city-managed project. Have I have I left anything out or made? No, no. <laughs> that was an ec excellent summary. I, um, Liz, Liz, thank you, directors, and, and Liz just asked me to provide a little bit of background on the park, since um, although um, um, uh, this park used to be directed at ESD, many of the directors are, are new to the project. Um, just to fill you in on a little bit more history, um, this project was uh, approved by in 2005 by the ESD board <coughs> and the BBPDC. 
uh, subsidiary at that point um, as a state love um, led project. Um, the BBPDC proceeded with starting to build the project, and since that time we've opened over 60% of the park on a phased basis. Um, I'm happy to say this summer we'll be opening 10 more acres of open space. The, that open space is funded um, at first by Port Authority funds, $85 million, and the remainder, which at this point is over um, $200 million, were, um, has been supplied by the City of New York. Um, the agreement in 2005 always stipulated that no public funds would be made available for maintenance and operation of the park or the waterfront infrastructure underneath the piers. That has proven to be um, the largest liability for the park and we've done a great deal of financial um, modeling and, and, um, and articulation of the liability of the, the waterfront piers, and I could certainly follow up um, with the financial model discussion to describe that. Um, in a nutshell, um, we estimate that over the next 50 years, there'll be over $300 million worth of um, uh, improvements uh, needed to uh, take place um, in for our waterfront infrastructure. Um, the um, development sites of the park are um, relegated to um, less than 10% of the project site. This was approved in 2005. Pier 6 is the last project site to, uh, needed to move forward with the, this financial model. Um, and at this point, um, as uh, um, General Counsel mentioned, um, we are um, moving forward with a public process to consider these changes to the Brooklyn Bridge Park um, general project plan that would give um, the, the city-led organization the ability to make um, a decision in that regard on locating affordable housing in the last um, development site about the um, height and the, and the relationship with bulkheads and then lastly about giving flexibility on um, the road system um, at Pier 6. Um, so we um, look forward to the comment period that, that um, will ensue over the next, um, over the, over the next period, and um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. So, the and just one other, and, and Rachel can address the issue of the environmental impact statement, but if the board today votes to approve, I think it's a draft plan, we will issue a 30-day notice for a public hearing. The public hearing would take place in Brooklyn. There would be, you know, ample opportunity for anybody who wanted to come and speak at that public hearing and address any aspect of this uh, proposed modification. And uh, we also will uh, have a 30-day period beyond the public meeting for uh, this the written submission of comments, submission of written comments, and at that time we will review the comments, both at the public hearing and the written comments, and if there are negative comments, which I anticipate there will be, this matter will come back to the Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation and to the ESD Board to either reject the proposal, accept the proposal, or accept it with modifications, and, you know, based on whatever uh, the comments are that are received. Any other questions from directors on this item for Regina or Liz? Do you want Rachel to address sure. the uh, environmental issues? Sure. sure. I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to explain the tech memo, the context of that review, the question of whether or not an SEIS is needed. Um, so. The, the passage of time in and of itself does not require the need to examine whether an SEIS is needed. It's if there are changes that you're aware of or if you're intentionally making changes to the project, um, something substantially different from what was examined initially or um, inadequately addresses the mitigation that was identified. And in this case, we knew that we were making these modifications to the GPP and that obviously necessitated the need to look at what kind of environmental review was needed. Um, and as this, uh, Regina had said, this project has been developed, um, except for these two parcels on, uh, these two buildings on parcel, these two parcels on Pier 6. 
Um, and those were the changes that the environmental review um, addressed. Uh, the park is built, um, as, as I said, except for the, the Pier 6 upland. Um, and we followed, we did do a state-led um, environmental review. And as we do at ESD, when projects are located in the city of New York, we follow the secret technical manual guidance. And that um, provides um, methodologies and appropriate study areas and thresholds for 19 environmental categories, which the tech memo <coughs> does address. And the conclusion from each of these 19 areas was that there were no significant adverse impacts and that is the determination that is needed to decide whether or not an SEIS is needed. And so that's why we have this tech memo. That's why the recommendation is being made to make a determination that no SEIS is needed. Uh, it doesn't mean that people can't comment on it during the public comment period. But uh, that is the determination that um, we're recommending for the directors in conjunction with this GPP law. Any questions from the directors to Regina or Rachel or Liz? Kenneth? Yeah, could we just, Liz, could you or go through that process question uh, in terms of the action we're being asked to take today, slowly and one more time? In other words, the the decision today, right, that we're being we'll, asked to we'll consider, trigger. right, and because part of this is about the modified GPP, part of that the tech memo, part of that the, right? So what's the action? Can you just do that again? The process so issue. The, 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 the approval of the proposal on the G modification for the GPP would trigger a public hearing right. with 30 days notice. So a notice would go out, and I know it would go out quickly because there's a strong interest on the part of the community to have a public hearing in July and not in August. Uh, or could wait till September, but it would go out probably for July, and there would be a public hearing, whether it lasts three hours, five hours, depends on how many people come to speak. And after the public hearing, there's a 30-day window for uh, us to receive written comments. Right. And at the end of that 30 days, the comments from the public hearing and the um, written comments that we receive, we will analyze them, and then we, if there are negative comments, which I anticipate there would be, uh, we will schedule a follow-up uh, meeting of the Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation Board, and of uh, this board to <coughs> consider three options, reject the modification, approve the modification, or approve it with changes. Uh, now, with respect, do you want to address the issue with what the consequences are of the approval of the uh, recommendation uh, not to do a supplemental EIS, and whether that is something that would then also be considered in, you know, subsequent meetings? Right. Is that a separate? Is it a separate action? No, I think uh, what you're thinking of is when we bring separately. Uh, the certification of a final environmental impact state, and that's usually a standalone item because it is following, because the draft EIS certification is coupled with the draft GPP mod, and then they both go out for public comment, and then we have to certify the FEIS because you can't do that at the same time you adopt secret findings, and we adopt secret findings when we affirm a GPP. Uh, in this case, there's no draft EIS. It's the, the tech memo, and the tech memo has concluded that no SEIS is needed. So it doesn't necessarily need to go out for public comment the way a DEIS does, but we're certainly um, open to any comment that is made during the comment period regarding its adequacy, just because it's part of the public <coughs> comment process. <coughs> Yeah, but it seems from the testimony we've heard today that um, there are significant questions about the tech memo and the EIS. Mm -hmm. And um, I would assume that at the public hearing, that's going to be further amplified. So 
what i am wondering about is what would what if after the public hearings which i think by the way the board should be notified about and we should be able to attend if we wish which is not the usual procedure frankly but which in this case given the significance of the projects i believe we should have the opportunity to avail ourselves of um if it at that point appears to the board members that a supplementary EIS would be required, what would then be the process? Uh, well, we would have, we, if that's what the board determined, um, an SEIS would need to be prepared and the action would need to be deferred until that process was completed. And we would then have to go through the public hearing provisions again, etc. It's a whole new it process. Would, it would be a whole new process. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it would result in a significant delay to the project. At, at any point, it would potentially, we don't know what the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation decision is going to be. That's out of our hands in terms of what they decide to do with the project. But we, they wouldn't have the opportunity to decide that until we completed the supplemental EIS. But the board has the authority to make that decision now or when the when the matter returns to the board in September October well what I would ask then is for this if the staff could respond to some of the questions that have been raised regarding the EIS particularly the uh, issues of school overcrowding because even in reading the technical memo it really doesn't specifically address what happens to those schools that are located near the proposed project. When you talk about overcrowding in the school district and construction of new schools in the school district but that really doesn't help with understanding what the impact is close to the project presume and i would assume the parents want their children to attend the closest school not just any school in the district and that therefore that would be significant to to current residents and to future residents and secondly also the transportation issues and thirdly um also one of the things that concerns me is the financial analysis and the whole question of given the development that's happened in Brooklyn and particularly this area of Brooklyn changes in the market how that affects the um, the um, size of the project the need for the project etc if the point of the project is in fact only to facilitate the oper to pay for the ma support the maintenance and operations of the park. Now, I, have, as many of you know, happen to be a major supporter of the need for more affordable housing. But this does raise the question of whether this is an appropriate venue for affordable housing. Um, it seems to have been grafted on after um, the original GPP was not part of it, and um, there, I do have questions about whether, in fact, that impacts the ability of the project to support the park in its current size and dimensions, number of units, etc. What the impact would be, um, whether um, it could be made small, whether the project could be made smaller and still be financially viable and provide the support that's needed, et cetera, and therefore preserve larger, a larger portion of the parkland. Uh, I, I can try and answer the schools and the transportation question, and I think Regina will do the last one. Um, so as I said, we follow the, the secret <coughs> manual uh, for um, the <coughs> methodologies for assessing potential impacts on all the categories. Um, following that methodology for schools, um, we looked at the subdistrict. Um, we work with the SEA and the Department of Education um, in identifying uh, 
um, where they are, well, according to whatever capital plan is uh, applicable, um, where they are allotting resources or constructing new schools, uh, using their projections, um, and um, as the tech memo describes, there um, is a combination to, um, of whether or not you're reaching over 100% capacity in your collective elementary and intermediate schools combined with a 5% or more um, increase. But that's in the entire district? In the subdistrict. Sub which, sub which is eight schools, right? Yeah. Okay. And it, it, how large is the subdistrict sub just geographically, in, and how does it relate to the project? David, can you? I mean, I'm not asking for the square mileage. I'm just get, trying to get an idea of it's what we're talking. What? It's about two or three neighborhoods combined. It's, it's Brooklyn Heights, Spinner Hill. That's, okay, uh, it's so it's not just neighborhood. the immediate neighborhood. There's two, and only two, subdistricts within the entire school district. So you're, you're talking about not one school, you're talking about half the school district. So I think that is a flawed analysis because you're building a building next to the school, not spread out over a subdistrict. And the fact that the technical memo guidelines require that this specific project reach 5% over capacity, that is a insane rule because there's 18 projects going on. And this one does 4%, this other one does 4%, this other one does 4%. They all meet the guidelines, but they add 30% to the school. Is that accurate? Uh, is that an accurate assessment? What we're required to do is to look at the study area that encompasses. But just in the context of this one project, not in. It, well, we take into, you take into consideration the background condition as well. And so that's why you have a study area and you have a build year. And the build year for this project is 2018. And so we looked at what other projects would be online in 2018 for this prescribed study area. And this is how every environmental review and EIS is done in New York City. Um, and that's what we subscribe to. Sure. Could I, could I just comment that you know, I'm just trying to keep an orderly meeting here. We, everyone has had a lot of time. We've been really patient with everybody to make comment. You're hearing lots of discussion here at the table. Uh, and so I'm really reluctant to just let the process go. Yes, Kenneth. Um, Rachel, there's just a little more on the tech memo. The, so the tech memo is, is the basis for the staff recommendation that no SEIS is required, correct? Okay. And just so we as directors get a little more sort of story behind the tech memo, it's from November 14th, right? AKRF did it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was <laughs> struck that more speakers didn't refer specifically to it, but to broader EIS issues. But just again, so we have a, a record of it. Um, when was it made public and how much have, you it know? It was made public in November. In November, so people have had plenty of time. Good, I'm just, it's important in terms website, of, right, I just want that to be clear that, you know, in terms of transparency and it sharing this, that obviously it's a public document and people have had a chance to review it. I do have a couple of questions about it, like Joyce does, um, and I suspect, you know, there'll be lots of discussion about it at the upcoming hearings and beyond. Um, and I guess, Regina, you can help with this, or sorry, um, not to put you on the spot, but uh, Rachel could help with this. You know, I, I have a particular concern um, about the degree to which potential impacts from the redevelopment of the Litch site were considered in the formulation of the tech memo last year, largely because that's a state action. The Litch site obviously was owned by this land and ended up being owned by SUNY and sold by the state, presumably to Fortis and so on. And in the tech memo, it's page eight, and this is, again, we don't have to confirm this today because it looks like we'll have plenty of time to talk. Sorry, page seven. Uh, it's it's um, development project, you know, planned projects in the study area by 2018. Um, and it's project 10. And it's listed as potentially 800,000 square feet of residential use, 130,000 square feet of health care use. And so the I have a couple questions about that. But the first is, Rachel, you know, as far as you know, like how the work was done uh, and what that, 
this is a very big project, as we all know. And again, it's a project that results from state action, so I think we have a connection to it. Um, and to what degree are those impacts, you know, in your view, kind of well considered in the tech memo? The potential well, impacts. We had from that specific project. I don't believe that it had been publicly announced, and so we didn't have a program. Mm -hmm. um, but we did look at development in mm -hmm. the area, and um, I just want to also note that when the EIS was done in 2005, there was quite a robust background uh, no build projection as well. Um, that included all of the downtown Brooklyn zoning projects, which may or may not have um, materialized. This, this, this tech memo, I think, it's a, is know, downtown Brooklyn. This is grounded on a very robust background, and and the tech memo. Um, did you want to add something, David? Yeah. One other thing I'd add is that the um, the Litch site, um, David Bowen, Vice President for Real Estate at the Park Corporation. The Litch site, um, in order to move forward, is going to go through the city's Hubert process, which will include its own environmental review process as well. So, so right. That, that I was going to. I was. I've heard that from local elected officials, and I was going to raise that, David. I'm glad you brought it up because, as a result of that process. The fact that it's going through the EULA process means you can't predict the outcome. Right. And under and law. So, but then, but then how does the tech memo reflect the impacts of a project whose fate has not been fully determined? Right. So, actually, on November 14th, 2014. The size of this project, that 800,000, is kind of our, our best yeah. estimate at this point in time, understanding that it, it's. It's under existing zoning? Uh, that's not under existing zoning. That was kind of the size that had been talked about. Right. right. Okay. And the distance from that? Site to your six, roughly? It's so less than three or four blocks. Feet. Yeah. Less than 500 feet? Uh, or the, the blocks are a little right. long there. Yeah. Little and just, just so directors who don't know the site it is have an appreciation two for or three it. It is in yeah. wholly the walking distance. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like, um, and obviously because projects come online at different times, it's not always possible. But frankly, um, Given my experience of real estate development in the city and also affordable housing development in the city, there is sometimes, and I'm not criticizing a particular administration because my experience spans a number of administrations, um, but there is a tendency to look at projects one by one rather than the totality. And that particularly when you're dealing with projects of this size, and the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge project is not a huge project by real estate residential development standards, but nevertheless a significant size and also a significant impact on the park, um, that the totality of the projected development needs to be taken into account when investigating and when evaluating the environmental impact of the project. That I, I think that's the intent of doing the no-build projections. Um, that's trying to capture everything, whether it's an as-of-right project or subject to its own environmental review. Um, the limitations to that are that we can only include those projects that have have, have plans. <laughs> um, I don't think I answered your transportation question. No. Um, again, we followed the secret technical manual. Um, the <clears throat> manual provides levels of screening to determine whether or not you have to advance to the next level of screening for analysis. Um, we did not screen out of level one, um, which uh, stipulates whether or not you have, or if you have uh, 50 vehicles during a peak hour, uh, then you need to advance to level two. Uh, I think also for pedestrians in transit, it's 200 persons for peak, per peak hour or trips. Um, and for pedestrians and traffic, I believe we advance to level two. Uh, and then at level two, it's if you're generating 50 vehicles during an, any given intersection, um, and um, you, you screened out of that, and so no additional analysis was needed. Um, and as I said, you know, the balance of the project was already analyzed in an EIS, so its traffic and 
all of the overall project traffic has been um, analyzed and we you know, had mitigation in place for that when it was all disclosed in 2005. And, um, and that takes into account also the impact on public transportation. Correct. Correct. It's um, pedestrians, uh, vehicles, um, which includes trucks, taxis, everything, and uh, subway and bus. I'm not advocating for new subway lines. But <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's been Rich. done. It's been done. I mean, you can do it for the far west side. I mean, why can't you do it? I shouldn't even say that. Um, Did I mention the highway? Um, the other, um, and director, the one thing I'd add on the transportation is um, the park as the local entity. Um, we have a loop road um, that actually surrounds um, both this project site and the adjacent building, and um, we are fine-tuning the traffic patterns um, with, um, upon the recommendations of Sam Schwartz. We engaged them last fall, and in coordination with New York City DOT, and we're actually making some of those improvements today. Um, they will be performed as a pilot project, and we will have the opportunity to um, readdress um, the results of those since this summer is the high peak season um, um, when we get back to you after the hearing. So I'm looking forward to the results of this. Um, there were certainly many comments we heard from local residents about especially queuing um, to some of the public features of the park, and we're working very hard to um, make those uh, changes on an interim basis and to assess them. Um, we'll be back to you um, with that assessment, um, and I'm happy that it's happening, honestly, just the week before July 4th, so the, the timing actually um, works very well for the assessment. Um, you did have questions about the financial mo right. model um, that I also wanted to um, address again. Um, as I mentioned, the overall projections for our park are based on a 50-year model of making sure that this is a self-sustaining park over the long time, given the very long, um, large liability of the waterfront infrastructure. Um, we have a very um, in-depth anal analysis of this that I'll, I'll, I'll forward to you. It's, it takes about a half hour to go through. Um, um, and um, we um, take this liability incredibly seriously, and I think in, in light of other major decisions about other waterfronts in New York City, this is, um, has very big context that we understand. Um, the other thing I would say, it, um, because it is true that the project did not initially have affordable housing when it was initially conceived, um, the market has changed in Brooklyn, as, as, as the directors have noted as well. Um, we are um, very proud that this public project can now uh, also include affordable housing, giving uh, affordable housing given the, the strength in the market at this moment, um, and that the, um, the very large amount of public um, support that this site has received, the idea that it can address uh, this second public policy goal. Um, um, is is um, the direction of the this, this, this city-led um, park at this point. Um, it is, though, um, very important to note that the finances of the park in terms of long-term sustainability um, require development at Pier 6, and that is what the um, financial model discussion um, um, uh, concludes. Senator Squadron's representative still here? Um, let, can I ask you a question? Because you're representing all of the local elected officials, is that correct? Uh, I'm not representing all of them, but, but they have. Uh, but they have. He has a boss. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I understand the difference. Um, you had mentioned um, that um, Senator Squadron as well as a number of the um, local, other local elected officials uh, were concerned about the EIS it's, and uh, I assume are questioning some of the conclusions in the tech memo. Was that fair? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've, we've reviewed it uh, on some level and I think our, our intent was to go more in depth on, on our specific concerns and testimony in the public hearing process. That would be next, I guess. But um, 
yeah, and we, we do have concerns, and, and we do feel that, that there's uh, more to be studied, more to be looked at here. So are you advocating for a supplemental uh, environmental statement? Yes. Also, um, I think you had mentioned um, that there was going to be an independent financial analysis performed by the, I believe, the city controller and the state controller, or just the city controller? No, no, the, um, that the city control board, as they contemplate these changes, uh, needs to, to conduct a financial analysis and present that. Um, yeah. Um, also, um, we have retained an independent analyst, analyst um, um, actually on the basis of a recommendation from Carol Kellerman at the <laughs> Citizen Budget mm. Commission, um, and we will... It used to be on the Citizens Budget Commission. <laughs> I do, no, I, do, I mean, we're taking this very yeah. seriously, and, and we will release that um, report. Um, we are... We have engaged her several months ago, and we hope to have a, um, have a, uh, a report for you review. I'm sorry, let me kind of quickly go back just to the school overcrowding issue, Rachel, and the degree to which it's captured in your view in the TECMO, because you, were, you made me think about downtown Brooklyn development a second ago. In, in other words, not really it's adjacent to the park per se, but one of the speakers referenced PSA, and as I recall, PSA serves downtown Brooklyn. It serves the public housing, Whitman, Ingersoll, Farragut, and beyond. It's not just a Brooklyn High School by any means. And so the subject has eight elementary schools that are at 98 percent capacity. But how much of that, and so in a way, there's a good story here, which is lots of families and lots of kids and schools that are doing well and so on. But how much of that um, dramatic growth in enrollment in those schools in the sub-district or the broader District 13 has come from all the downtown, the downtown Brooklyn redevelopment, which was largely envisioned originally to be commercial, as we all know, and is really largely at this point residential. I mean, I'm really talking about sort of, you know, the downtown Brooklyn area, those between Brooklyn Heights and Fort Greene, let's say, right? So that's probably driven a lot of the enrollment. I'm just wondering if the Tecnomo <coughs> I don't think it ascribes um, the general growth in enrollment to downtown Brooklyn. I think it's generated in the projections. So, I mean, we could go and look at the yeah. SEA projections and see if we can break it out for you that the way. SCA, so right. The SEA does the enrollment projections, right? I'm just and saying because there's, there's, no, there's, there's also, so much there's ongoing residential construction in downtown Brooklyn, you know, that we all know and this agency's had a part in, uh, in some of the projects anyway. Um, you know, but there's, there's a lot, as we sit here, right, there's more and more residential construction going on that will ideally, you know, one hopes lead to families and children and, and so the findings in the tech memo about those eight schools that are at 98 percent today. Um, again, I don't know. I'm, not, I mean, probably, I'm probably not asking the question well. No, I, but, I understand what but, you're saying. But I can the, tell that, you what we're generating yeah. and what that contributes. Those numbers I can give you. Right. Where those other projections come from and where they're attributed to, we have to right. go back to the data. Right. In other words, in order, to, in order to have a finding of sort of no effect, there's an assumption that you're at 98 percent, or we're at 98 percent today in that sub-district, and over 100 percent, one speaker alleged, at PSA in particular. But to say that there's no significant effect by caused by this project is based on an assumption of all the other forces that drive kids to those schools. That's all, right? Well, it's based on the data that we have for what we know the project is responsible for based on projections that the SEA provide for that period no, of the right, plan, right. based on where they've identified additional resources or <coughs> capital projects. And sure, because they could be building other schools as well, right? For yeah. whatever, yeah, and that right. period could could go beyond when our build year is even so. Right, right. You, right. Well, so we have, okay, I think you um, Let me suggest that we, um, you know, we've talked at length here uh, Liz, on two occasions you have now laid out uh, what the next steps are if the board approved this resolution. We've not talked about the consequences if the board does not approve the resolution. And just so for everyone's understanding, maybe you could discuss what the implications of not approving the resolution are, because we've, we've talked at some length on, you know, the, what happens, what gets triggered if we do approve the resolution. Okay, so we talked about the three essential elements of the change in the, in the proposed modification, a 
slight reduction in the height of the two buildings to the extent that the the mechanicals would be included in the on second the outer road and third deferring decisions about what the composition of those two buildings would be deferring those to the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation. If we don't do that, we have the language in the mo in the general project plan would continue as it is now, and I can read that to you. It says one building would be approximately 315 feet in height and have up to 290 units. The other building would be approximately 155 feet in height and could contain up to 140 units. The, this building could possibly include a ground floor retail, could include ground floor retail uses. So the Brooklyn Bridge Park Corporation can make whatever decisions they make about the building of those two buildings uh, within those confines. But um, just for clarification, I understand that the modifications that we would be recommending only deal with the um, the height of the building, the composition of the uh, residence, and the loop road. Um, the problem that I think we're having is that our responsibility and is regarding the environmental impact statement. That's what we're responsible for and for assuring that that is that the statement itself is adequate and adequately analyzes the impact of the project. Um, and so I think that my problem, frankly, is with the EIS and with the tech memo, and not so much with the modifications per se. I mean, I understand, obviously, that there was a dispute over the actual, what the actual maximum height of the building was and whether the mechanical should be included, and that that's an important issue in and of itself. But unfortunately, it's, it seems to let this project proceed on this basis, you know, and just saying, okay, you know, we are recommending the modifications, we're allowing the development corporation to go ahead and make the changes in those, you know, to make those modifications. Um, it unfortunately also has or implies a um, an approval of the tech memo and the fact that we're using a 10-year-old EIS here, um, which I have hesitations about. And I'm also concerned that letting the project proceed at this point would simply result in kicking the can down the road, as they say at the federal level, and that this is only going to come back to bite us later on um, when these issues come up again. Um, after the uh, public hearing, which is going to raise a lot of these issues also. Um, and I'm just really, um, frankly, ambivalent about what the best course of action is today. You know, the best course of action for us to take. If we don't, I'm, just, I'm sorry, if we don't take action today, there'll be no public hearing, there'll be no further comment or opportunity for comment. This is just to give an opportunity to cr open the public comment period to go forward. Okay, but does the uh, modifications that are being requested or that are being considered, that's what triggered the tech memo, correct? And the revised, uh, the re-looking or the re-examination of the EIS. But can I, Joyce, try to, yeah. you know, put an asterisk or Please a footnote on your, on, <laughs> on your observation? If we do approve the recommendation before us this morning, to Richard's point, we initiate a process of what will be, I think, significant public comment, length, you know, 30-day periods before and after. And the whole matter comes back to us. Well, it goes back to the Corporation Board, right? Mm -hmm. no. Um, or, no, it comes to Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation. Corporation. Board. Okay, yeah. right, right, right. State. It comes back to us, because, I mean, I'm just thinking about other actions like this where we've had this Atlantic Yards and other issues mm -hmm. that's worked the same way. So it comes back to us, Joyce, right? Right. In some months' time with uh, 
probably, you know, as you say, we can go to the hearings. And, but but uh, with all of that public comment about this, including, I suspect, voluminous comment on the, S on the question of is an SEIS required or not? Is the tech memo sufficient to justify not requiring it? Um, and so my, if I, that's why I asked the process question triggered somewhat by Tony, but largely just directed to Liz um, at the onset, which is um, we, can we can choose to initiate this process today, and then that process occurs. And, and as directors, we, we could, at the end of that process, decide we don't like the SEIS, go do a new one. Or the EIS, go you do the FEIS. Yes. Pardon me? What would, what would the, 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 the we would, we, we could, Some... we could We could say that we as directors, at the end of that process, could. I'm just trying to like, see what our options right. are, right? Based, um, based on the public based comments. Based on the public comments, say, you know what? We, don't, uh, we, we can't support the findings of the November 14th Tech Memo. Thus, uh, a new F, a new, an SEIS is required. So then what does that, the, the termination that's in the... I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I want to... ...regarding the tech memo now, what does, what happens to that? Right. Can, the determination, you, I mean, we have to do resolution? an environmental review with respect to the action that we're taking now. The environmental review that's being, that has been taken with respect to just this adoption for the purposes of a public hearing is what appears in the tech memo. If at the end of the process the board is, finds that that is insufficient, they can require whatever further environmental review they, they would prefer. So this would just be, again, getting the process getting the started. Process started. We've right. taken an environmental, we've taken a look at the environmental consequences, we've done an environmental review to get us to this point. If something more has to be done, it can be determined at the next stage of this. And that's <laughs> including, <laughs> including, for example, a new tech memo to replace the. I mean, yes, technically, right? You right. could say, or, we, or yes. right? But I mean, there are options at the end of the process. Right. You know, and, or it's just green light go. Everything's fine. Right. Or it could be, you know, there's some concerns with, again, based on input from the public comment period, uh, with some of the findings or some of the method or whatever with the tech memo of number 14th. Go do a new one. Or there's significant concerns. Go do uh, an SEIS. So all of those options remain before us. As the litigant that led to this, the problem that, that puts on the community is that there's would likely be a court challenge of the tech memo, and right. so if you adopt the tech memo, then that forces people to to, to challenge it in court if it's going to stand. And that process is, would rather we'd rather not have that happen. So if there's a way not to adopt the tech memo, then you avoid putting this back in court again, which is you know it should be through the public process. You're, you're forcing everyone to to run back to court, which is just the wrong way to right. go. Hmm. The tech memo, I'll, I guess I'll repeat myself, the tech memo is the environmental review that is done at this time. The information that we have, the application of the seeker manual as performed in the tech memo is what we have. At this point, that's the environmental review that is available to us to go forward to adopt the modification solely for the purpose of public comment. Um, that's that's where we are at this point with respect to this. Let me ask the directors because I mean we have all spent a lot of time on this. So it's an important item. Uh, we appreciate all the public input and participation and all the time and effort by the directors and discussion around the table. Do we have enough information, or are there more questions uh, from the directors before we consider the resolution, which was now read two hours ago? So, are we? Can we, you know, people are free to vote how they choose, but are you comfortable that we call this motion one way or the other, or do you have more questions that you want to ask? Liz was about to make a clarifying point. Uh, well, uh, Director Miller asked a question about why we prepared the tech memo, and I just wanted to make sure we we're clear on the record that it wasn't prepared based on this modification. It was prepared in November before we considered the modification. Uh, it was prepared based on responses that the part got from the RFP for the two yeah. proposals. So in, consider in consideration of what uh, would be approved, what, what could be the, the range of possibilities for development on those two parcels, Questions. the tech memo was um, constructed to address those. It was also prepared in connection with uh, judges order in connection with a Correct. temporary restraining order on uh, the ability of staff to consider 
any of the proposals the ability of b b p staff to consider the proposals that have been brought by the in connection with the r p process i mean i think we as a authority have acted responsibly throughout this process so are there more questions yeah i just want on clarification um at the public hearing um the implication has been that public comments can cover any of the issues that the public sees fits to question or address it's not limited to just the modifications is that correct well that that is the purpose of the hearing right? the purpose of the hearing is to take comment on the modification if someone wants to speak on some other topic they'll get the allotted time and be able to speak okay, so they'll that. be free they'll be free to do it they won't be um, I think the distinction I was trying to make was when you prepare a draft environmental impact statement you are required <coughs> to have it um, subject to public review and then the right. public review that results from that needs to be documented in a final environmental impact statement but for things like environmental assessments or things like tech memos there's not the requirement to do that but that's why I said we the tech memo could be the subject of public comment during our comment period as well we're not but it's that. not required no that's fine um, I just wanted to be uh, the reassurance that in fact if <coughs> members of the public or the elected officials wanted to comment on something that was not directly related to the modification the modifications themselves but broader, such as the tech memo such as the tech yeah. memo right that they would be allowed to do so that's all okay well thank you all for the extensive conversation on this is there a motion right. to yeah. sorry is there a motion to approve the resolution uh, read by mr dorado some time ago <laughs> the directors is there a motion to approve none of the directors makes the motion no there's motion. yes uh, is there a second Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank everyone for their participation. Uh, coming to you. Sir Howard, Howard, to see you. Imagine the residential development in Outer Harbor. Sam and I used to talk about this because you know, last a year ago now, when he would do the visioning sessions, you know, in Higgins, and how much residential development in a in a park. Yeah. This is that debate. Yeah. Ten years. Ten, ten years. Yeah. Thousand square foot. And that's what's interesting. Was right. That's what's interesting. Resident development in this park was always envisioned and accepted reluctantly. I was part of the original group. Bitter pill. Because the city said, we're not paying your maintenance bill for a waterfront park. You want a park, have a sufficient development, sufficient development to support the maintenance of the park. self sustaining park, right. And so people sort of, you know, bit their lips and said, well, that's, what we, that, that's the bitter pill. We'll, we'll swallow it. So you have approvals in the original plan for basically three sites. And one was already there. And um, But in 10 years, the market changes dramatically. So then a square if foot basis, a what you had said, yeah. it would generate X dollars. Well, now, in the center, it's crazy. You have to, you know, and I'm about about Regina can tell you. Regina, no, I shouldn't. Yeah. We'll talk about it later. But housing values, right? You know, Howard knows something about this. She's, she's like swimming in money. Yes. Who's swimming in You. Who is? I'm swimming in the maritime infrastructure. I know. You're, you are swimming, swimming in expenses, uh, you know, in bills. You're swimming in bills. That, that, I think so. In this heightened market, it's not only has the housing prices escalated, so your but, but, but the construction has gone from seven hundred dollars a foot in concrete to eleven hundred yeah. so, so those are the things that we're balancing and so that, that's that's not going away but one of the questions i had which i didn't want to raise on the table was, um, about the sewage and the water disposal the, the whole question of the gray water and the fact that they're not presenting any kind of um of systems to deal with it in other words, they're following the building code, right. but they're not going beyond the building code. The discussion is being picked up on the phone and probably... Well, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, we have more on the agenda, don't we? <laughs> a few items. More coffee. <laughs> Hi, are all the regional offices still on? Capital Hi. Region's on. Here. Western New York. Central's on. And uh, Mohawk is also. All right, Long Island's still hanging in here. And the Finger Lake's still hanging in. Okay. That was really something, wasn't it? It's to in New York. second week of July. Trouble in New York. He's come see you. 
and they were going to do a joint project. <laughs> put us all to sleep. Right? <laughs> you're so excited. Exactly. Well, like these three days. Put us all to sleep. I figured after this uh, event, party. okay, everyone. <laughs> I got it. No, I'm talking. Wait, we're talking about you. Right. Your uh, life is so boring. Be the memo goes to the chamber the night before. I need to hold all night. Make the work done. Every one of these, every one of the syndicates. I would probably just watch it on the webcast in case something comes up. So, what other industries want to do? Well, you know, I know. Well, I was 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 I yeah, yeah. Great idea. That's a great idea. And, and then we have some other kind of some other uh, suppliers that you know create the fermentation packs. Feldmeyer. Uh, yeah. And the last one doesn't fall into any of the yeah, that's what I'm saying. I haven't, I didn't conceptualize it as a document. That's, the, that's great. I mean, if you want to, I mean, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, my guess is that I'll probably have to cover the <laughs> audit meeting for legal. Yeah, but I want to do sports and I want to do. No, no, the audit meeting. The main members meeting. So the audit meeting. I got to see if they go, oh, yeah. Yeah, they could like four or That didn't work. I couldn't do it because it was a great job. Oh, it was a great job. But it was the only, all basis of all the Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, right. so yeah. 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 Um, I'm asking I guess in a sinister All right, thanks folks. We're gonna give you a detail Hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna get started again and try and cut down on the sidebar conversation because we're a little maybe behind schedule. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna move pretty quickly. We're gonna attempt to move pretty quickly um, through the rest of the agenda with the exception, Kathleen, of your report. It's, um, we're gonna take a normal amount of time and then on all the regional projects, uh, meaning no disrespect because they're all extremely important. Um, but we have to make up time somewhere. So we're just going to ask folks to give unusually brief presentations on those. <coughs> and then what I'm going to suggest to the directors is we just take all of those regional projects as a batch at the end. Okay, so we won't make a motion and go through all of that after every single project. We will batch those together at the end and make a motion on all those regional projects. So. Kathleen. Thank you, Howard, and good morning, directors. The public authorities law requires annual approval by the corporation's <laughs> board of directors and certifications by the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer or other designated finance officer of certain financial reports, referred to as the reports. The reports consist of financial information set forth in the consolidated financial statements and independent auditor's report the audit report as prepared by the corporation's independent audit firm, Toski & Company, PC. The audit report for the fiscal year ended March 31, 2015, contains an unmodified, clean opinion reflecting that the consolidated financial statements present fairly, in all material respects, the financial position, results of operations, and cash flows of the corporation and its subsidiaries. In addition, the Independent Auditor's Report on Internal Control over Financial Reporting and on Compliance Addressing Whether Control Deficiencies or Material Weaknesses in Internal Control Exist 
did not identify any deficiencies that would be considered to be material weaknesses. The audit firm was able to obtain reasonable assurance that the corporation's financial statements are free of material misstatement by performing tests of compliance with certain provisions of laws, regulations, contracts, and grant agreements, including the corporation's investment guidelines and other matters. Noncompliance with any of these could have had a direct and material effect on the financial statements. The testing revealed no instances of noncompliance or other matters that are required to be reported. Included in the materials presented is the complete audit report for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2015. The preparation of the audit report included approximately 21% participation by an MWBE firm. The Audit Committee of the Corporation has reviewed and approves the audit report. I and staff from our audit firm are available to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. I did also meet with Kathleen and the auditors in Buffalo, and I confirm everything that Kathleen has said. Are there any questions for Kathleen regarding the audit? A motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Seconded by Second. Joyce. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Glendon, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning. The directors will be requested to consider 25 discretionary projects, including one open for business, craft beverage marketing grant for $168,300. Four Empire State Economic Development Fund grants totaling six million six hundred and twenty-eight thousand five hundred dollars, and one ESD operating funds loan for five hundred thousand dollars. The twenty-five projects include twenty regional council awards to be funded as follows: three Empire State Economic Development Fund grants totaling one million, uh, twelve regional council capital fund grants totaling ten million six hundred and seventy-three thousand. And one Market New York grant totaling uh, 460137000 The 25 projects take place in all 10 regions, will leverage $497 million of additional investments, will retain 1,661 jobs, and create 426 jobs in the state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to um, ask folks to give brief descriptions. We're going to hold our questions and... Uh, Final uh, authorization to the end. Edward, are you here from Finger Lake Region? Yes. Uh, good morning. I hope everyone can hear me all right, and I'll uh, present RetroTech. This is a five hundred thousand okay. dollar five hundred thousand dollar grant to RetroTech, Incorporated for new machinery. The company uh, designs and produces customized material handling systems. Uh, its uh, parent company, a French company, uh, purchased the company uh, several years ago and uh, wanted to make it into a North American hub. Uh, because of significant growth, Retrotech needed a larger facility. It looked in the Finger Lakes region and it also looked in the state of Illinois. Uh, ESD, uh, when they approached us, ESD offered a $500,000 capital grant and uh, the company settled on its uh, project location in the suburb of West Henrietta. Uh, they had a contractor build a building, uh, 41,000 square feet. Uh, project is completed, retains uh, 87 jobs, and will create 23 new jobs, and all of those have already been created. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Edward. Appreciate it. John from the North Country. Uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I just want to check that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I have uh, directors that have asked to approve a $400,000 grant award to Upstate Niagara Cooperative. The project supports the North Country Regional Economic Development Council's plan to support existing employers, especially in the dairy industry, which is key economic sector in the North Country. The uh, ESD grant is $400,000 towards a $14 million project. Without ESD assistance, the project would not be possible. Upstate Niagara purchased, renovated, and equipped a 100-year-old underperforming dairy facility in North Lawrence, St. Lawrence County. The company has also purchased and installed new state-of-the-art equipment for the production of regular and Greek-style yogurt. 
Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Marion? Directors are being requested to authorize a convertible loan of up to a half million dollars to the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation in order to capitalize the Bronx Revolving Loan Fund. BOEDC will initialize the program with an additional $400,000, bringing the total amount available to $900,000. The loans will range from microloans to $25,000 and less, and loans between $25,000 and $250,000. The loan to BOEDC is for a term of five years at a 1% interest. Great. Thanks, Marion. Uh, Sam, will you uh, present Craft Beverage Grant Program? Uh, good morning. The directors are requested to approve a $168,300 grant for the Adirondack Chamber of Commerce. This is through the uh, Craft Beverage Grant Program, the tourism promotion uh, portion of that. Uh, Adirondack Chamber of Commerce launched their Adirondack Craft Beverage Trail uh, last July 2014. Uh, they started with six producers. They have now expanded to 23. It covers more in Saratoga and Washington counties. Uh, our grant will enable them to uh, conduct more marketing. They'll produce 40,000 new brochures, do radio and print advertising in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut uh, metropolitan markets. And they will also develop a new website and mobile app. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to regional council awards. Uh, Good morning. In connection with the Brooklyn Navy Yard Steiner Studios Capital Grant Project, the directors are being requested to accept and approve the final environmental impact statement and to authorize its publication, filing, and circulation. The project involves the transformation of approximately 43 acres at the Brooklyn Navy Yard into a state-of-the-art full-service media campus. At a later date, the directors will be requested to make findings pursuant to CICRA, and, to, and the UDC Act and to approve hmm. the grant for the proposed project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike Paul from Western New York. Good morning. Uh, the first of three projects uh, in front of you today from our region is a request to approve a $2.8 million grant from the Regional Council Capital Fund, Alfred University, for the building, construction, and machine and equipment necessary to complete the Center for High Temperature Characterization Lab. <laughs> It's a round one 2011 CFA regional council priority project. Alfred and Corning Incorporated collaborated in 2008 to expand and improve Alfred's New York State College of Ceramics by establishing the Center for High Temp Characterization and also received SUNY construction funds for the project. However, Alfred did not have sufficient funds to expand capabilities to include in-house imaging and testing for renewable energy systems and high temperature battery applications. But as a result of the governor's REDC initiative, Alfred was able to complete the unique state-of-the-art center, allowing the university to become a highly specialized research and testing facility. The $9.8 million project includes LEED certified building renovations of their students' engineering project lab building, which will house relocated existing labs for wind energy, fluid mechanics, thermal science, solar energy, uh, photovoltaic solar energy, alternative fuels, um, an 8,000 square foot addition to the McMahon building will house five new high temperature equipment suites. The project is expected to expand Alfred's New York State College of Ceramics, uh, attracting more young people and companies to Allegheny County in the region through larger enrollment and specialized mm -hmm. research. The project is expected to be completed in December of 2016. Okay, thanks. You have two okay. more, Mike? I do. Uh, so right. on. <coughs> so uh, the directors are also requested to approve a $500,000 capital grant from the Regional Council Capital Fund to the Research Foundation for the State University of New York on behalf of Alfred State College for new machinery and equipment for the Sustainable Advanced Manufacturing Center on Alfred State's Wellsville campus. This is a 2013 CFA Regional Council priority project. In 2013, Governor Cuomo awarded $60 million to four innovative projects in round two of the competitive SUNY 2020 Challenge Grant Program. Four winning projects were awarded $15 million each, including the retooling the Southern Tier Initiative, which was dedicated to $4.5 million to the construction of this center. 
That funding is dedicated to construction costs only, which left a gap in financing for machinery and equipment. The Western New York REDC award assists with these costs, and without the grant, the project would be delayed until other sources of funding could be found. So the $5.5 million project involves construction of a new 16,000 square foot state-of-the-art center where students in welding, electrical construction and maintenance, and machine tool technology will be trained using state-of-the-art renewable energy aspects and will be encouraged to make improvements through waste reduction and other Lean Six Sigma processes. Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. Last one. Right. Mike, last, last one. one. Reach uh, yep. Warren Martin. So the last one is to approve $268,000 grant from the Regional Council Capital Fund for the Martin House Restoration Corporation. It's a 2013 Regional Council priority project. Um, this project involved a $1.2 million expenditure for the restoration of the basement portion, uh, including refinishing and replacing of historical woodwork finishes and transforming the space. The project, which was complete last month, will promote cultural arts and tourism. Uh, thank you. I'll answer any questions. Great. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Ken Tompkins, are you on the line from Mohawk Valley? I am, and I think I can still say good morning to you, Mr. Chairman and Directors. Uh, you are being asked to approve a $1,775,000 capital grant award from the Regional Council Capital Fund for the Valley Health Services. Living Learning Center. Uh, VHS constructed a new assisted living facility, complete with an integrated center for health care worker training. Very important uh, where we live uh, to have a uh, qualified workforce to take, take care of the area's older individuals uh, and to ensure the desired quality of life for this rapidly growing population. This is a round two uh, regional council uh, priority project it is 100 percent complete the budget was 12.5 uh, million dollars and it has met its job commitment thanks ken excellent um barry greenspan from long island yes and now i'll say good afternoon to all the esd directors <laughs> the esd directors are asked to approve a one million dollar grant for stony brook university to train and graduate additional engineering professionals for our region this was a round one regional council priority project based on the shortage of engineers in the region. Stony Brook's program has been a $4.1 million investment to add new engineering professors and retrofit labs. They've added 20 new jobs, far exceeding the 20 professors they had committed to. In addition, Stony Brook reports that since 2011, enrollment in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences has increased 35%. So by all measures, this is a highly successful project. We're requesting your approval to disperse the grant. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Jim Fail, are you with us? Oh, no. Sorry, Brian. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The ESD directors are asked to approve a project supporting a regional initiative to deliver funding to small businesses in Long Island's legacy industries of farming and poultry production. This project, HF Corwin and Sons, originated from the Long Island Regional Economic Development Council's Natural Assets Work Group and was deemed a Long Island Regional Priority Project. HF Corwin and Sons is a family-owned business that was established in 1908. Long Island's once thriving industry of nearly 100 duck farms has shrunk to only one, the Crescent Duck Farm, located on 140 acres in Aquabog in Suffolk County. Corwin's farm breeds, hatches, and grows ducks and is responsible for approximately 4% of the nation's total duck production. This includes ready-to-cook ducklings and duckling products. Serving the integrity and the biosecurity of the food supply is of utmost importance to HF Corwin. For 150,000 ducks on the farm and upgrades to the hatchery were needed to prevent the spread of disease among the duck population. The state-of-the-art single batch process will contribute to the sterility of the hatchery and prevent widespread contamination of the duck farm. Significant investment was needed in order to make the improvements remain a viable business. If it works like it does. Designated Great. as a priority project by the LIREDC during round two of the consolidated funding application, HF Corn was awarded a $250,000 grant from ESD to upgrade their existing duck, duck hatchery system in two phases. The first phase is a new electrical distribution system and the second phase is installation of the new 7,000 square foot hatchery. The first phase has been completed at a cost of over $1 million. 
As part of its expenditure, HF Corwin installed new electric infrastructure throughout the farm, which included a new electric building, the 2,500 amp switchgear equipment, additional utility poles, underground distribution, a 700 kilowatt generator, and a new refrigeration system. We're requesting your approval to disperse 50% of the grant. Okay. Brian, thank you very much. Uh, Jim Fail from Central. Good afternoon. I have two projects today for the directors to approve. The first is a $680,000 grant on a $1.4 million project that will renovate a former 65,000 square foot manufacturing facility. It's a site visit. It will be converted into a artist facility for musicians, artists, film production, recording, etc. Uh, in uh, the, the, uh, a very depressed area of uh, the city. Uh, this was a priority project uh, in round two. Um, the second project is a uh, $5 million grant uh, to Novellus Corporation uh, to assist in a $200 million um, expansion project uh, that led to the creation of uh, 90 new jobs. Um, and, uh, and this project has been complete and the jobs have been created, and this was uh, outside the uh, regional council process, but the regional council does support this project. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, those, you, did you go through both of them? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Edward, are you still on the line? I think you're up again. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, the directors are asked to approve uh, $500,000 grant to the University of, of Rochester uh, for uh, equipping two facilities. One is the uh, Health Science Center for Computational Innovation, and the second one is its upstate stem, stem cell facility. Uh, these are priority projects. Uh, the super, super Computing Center allows uh, expansion uh, for medical research uh, analytics and the stem cell uh, supports production of uh, human, uh, human uh, stem cells for human use. This was uh, a round three uh, regional council process uh, project and uh, it leveraged resources to support these two facilities. So. Uh, yeah, both, both components are expected to stimulate regional economic development by generating uh, innovative new technologies that can be spun off into commercial ventures. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, North Country, are you with us? Yes, good afternoon again. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, the directors are asked to approve a $500,000 grant to the village of Uvalton for municipal wastewater infrastructure improvements project is consistent with the North Country Council and it would not be possible with ESD assistance. The uh, ESD grant is for $500,000 towards a $2,775,000 project. The uh, village uh, plan designed and installed upgrades and improvements to its wastewater system. The project consisted of replacement of approximately 10,000 feet of sewer pipelines. The project provides for enhanced quality of life for the community with an improved wastewater system for health and safety and provides for future growth opportunities for the village of Ubleton. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie's with us from Southern Tier. Good morning. I have two projects for you this morning. The first is for the Corning Diesel Capital II project. The directors are requested to approve a grant of $3 million to Corning Incorporated for a portion of the $250 million cost of purchasing and installing machinery and equipment to support the company's facility expansion, which is a 90,000 square foot addition to the company's environmental technologies plant in the town of Irwin. This expansion will facilitate increased production capacity for a new heavy duty engine emission control device product line for the global market. This is a CFA2 priority project for our region. The project was completed in March of 2015 and is consistent with the Southern Tier Regional Economic Development Council strategic plan. As a result of the ESD funding, Corning Incorporated will retain 500 existing jobs and create 250 new jobs through 2020. Great. The second project is the 
The second project is the Broome County IDA Indian Valley Industries, Inc. project. The directors are requested to approve a capital grant of $728,500 to the Broome County Industrial Development Agency for a portion of the $2.1 million cost of acquiring a manufacturing facility to facilitate relocation of Indian Valley Industries, Inc., a manufacturer of environmental protection and containment products currently located in Broome County. This project is complete. Relocation of the company was necessitated in order to make way for construction of the new Binghamton University Pharmacy School in Johnson City. ESD participation in the project will result in retention of Indian Valley Industries in the southern tier and in New York State. The project aligns with the Southern Tier Economic Development Plan and is consistent um, with um, our efforts here in the Southern Tier to revitalize our manufacturing area. The project will Thanks, result Brian. in 40 jobs. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Arnie Will from uh, Capital, are you with us? Uh, actually, you have Linda Dillon sitting in for Arnie. Um, the directors are requested to approve a $250,000 capital grant to Capital District Community Gardens, um, doing business as Capital Roots. This is to support a $2.3 million investment uh, to establish an urban growth center in the city of Troy um, to extend the availability and access and distribution of locally grown foods. Um, the company had been operating in small space and, and lacked the resources to efficiently meet the growing demands of, of farmers and others. Um, the company applied to and award, was awarded a round two CFA capital grant and the project was selected as a priority by the Capital Region Economic Development Council. Uh, the project involved the renovation, the purchase and renovation of a vacant 10,000 square foot building in the city of Troy and it was completed in December of 2014. Um, as a result of the project, Capital Roots uh, will triple the volume of locally grown fresh fruit and produce it receives and distributes is exceeding a million pounds per year. Full-time employment has increased from 18 to 25, and the project now provides direct access to fresh produce for an underserviced area uh, in the city of Troy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Linda. Um, Market New York Grant Program, Gavin? Uh, you actually have Kelly Baccarizzo um, on behalf of Gavin Landry today. Uh, we're okay. bringing uh, before... We're bringing before you today um, for your um, approval five Market New York tourism projects totaling $460,137. One is from round three and is a capital project. It's completed. It is the Schenectady Museum Association, and um, it, the capital project involved renovations at the uh, Suits Bush Museum in Schenectady that included the purchase of installation of a high-def um, dome projection system and other renovations to their museum museum in order to increase tourism to the destination as well as to the region. Um, the next four projects are round four projects and they are all working capital and they're all in progress. First is the Phoenicia Festival of the Voice um, located in the Mid-Hudson region. Um, the Phoenicia International Festival of, of the Voice is um, doing a promotional marketing project that will promote not only their event but also their venue and bring increased tourism to the region. Um, and their grant was for $65,000. The second working capital project is for Proctor's Theater in the Capital Region. Um, it is a promotion, multi-platform marketing promotion to uh, market their series of events as well as their venue and bring increased tourism um, to the region. The third project uh, is located in the Capital Region, the Albany Convention and Visitors Bureau, and their project involves supporting um, the MAC and NCAA regional playoffs in the Albany area, marketing those events and bringing uh, tourists to the region for the events and the surrounding other destinations. And the last project is uh, Central New York uh, CNY Arts. Um, for a uh, arts and cultural program marketing arts and cultural events in the central New York region. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Hey, Under I'm regional I'm council... Hello? Okay. Under regional council award projects, consent calendar, oh, Simone. Just to, you know, in case anybody has any questions... Good afternoon. Uh, Jim, sorry, you're almost done. Sorry, is somebody, somebody's on the phone and it should be on mute and it's not. Can you put it on mute? There you go. Thank you. Okay, Simone. 
The directors are being requested to approve funding for three regional council consent projects. The first project is a $25,000 grant to Cobleskill Agricultural Society, the Society, for a portion of the cost to reconstruct and renovate the Cobleskill Fairgrounds, which were damaged by flooding in 2011 due to Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. Uh, the Society was founded in 1876 and manages the annual Schoharie County Sunshine Fair. In July 2012, the organization applied under Round 2 of the Consolidated Funding Application to offset the cost of repairing damage to the fairgrounds. ESD made the organization an offer of assistance in March 2013, which the organization accepted in April of that year. Total project costs were approximately $59,400, and the project was completed in September 2014. The second project is a $25,000 grant to Valley Cinema, which is one of two theaters in Herkimer County hosting screenings for the Mohawk Valley Center of the Arts. Um, the grant will be used by Valley Cinema to modernize projection equipment at one of its two theaters, which will allow for continued and improved operation. The project was completed in February 2015. Total project costs are approximately $100,000. And the third project is a $100,000 grant to Anson Corporation for the purchase of machinery and equipment. Um, Anson Corporation was formed in 2013 as a contract manufacturing business for specialty electronic subcomponents. Anson needed to upgrade some of its technical production equipment to increase competi competitiveness and productive capacity. The company applied under round three of the consolidated funding application and was awarded $100,000 from the North Country Regional Economic Development Council. Total project costs were approximately $500,000 and the project was completed in December 2014. The project will obtain 100 jobs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Simone. Um, Ed, Ed uh, Mazinski under the category of non-discretionary project consent calendar. Uh, thank you. There is one project, a, a $20 million grant to ESF College Foundation on behalf of SUNY's College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, this is from the uh, SUNY 2020 Challenge Grant Program. Uh, that program, uh, as you may know, spurs economic development uh, through the uh, SUNY colleges and universities and opportunities uh, around them. Uh, this is a uh, water research and education center to be built on Onondaga Lake, a 34,000 square foot environmental friendly LEED Gold certified building. Uh, the center will bring research, educational opportunity, tourism, and sustainable development to uh, to this lake, Onondaga Lake, a nationally recognized, uh, uh, having uh, a cleanup effort that is nationally recognized. Uh, project costs are $23 million, with construction expected to begin in January of 2016. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Administrative action, Steve Gawlik. Hello. Um, Today, the board's being asked to approve a land bank application for Seneca County. Um, the, land bank app, the land bank program allows municipalities to create not-for-profits to acquire property that's tax delinquent and vacant. Our role, ESD's role is, under the statute, is to receive applications and approve them. Um, Seneca County has submitted an application. Um, it meets all the criteria, so we're asking that the land bank application be approved for Seneca County. Uh, the, the second, second item is uh, authorizing amended contract with the Research Foundation of SUNY to, for support services for the Buffalo Billion Initiative. Um, the contract was bid out last year. The board approved a one-year contract with um, the SUNY Foundation to provide support services for the Buffalo Billion. Our bid allowed us to renew that contract for an additional year, and we're asking the board to authorize an additional year for another 999000 and some change. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Steve. Before we um, consider administrative items, we'll go back and ask uh, if there's any comment or questions on the prior 21 regional and other projects that were discussed from the directors. Any comment from, from the director, sorry. Any comment or questions from the public? Is there a motion to approve the 21 prior items? So moved. So moved. Second. Kenneth seconded. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? No. 
Thank you. Director Miller has questions about the ducks, but we're going to save them for yeah, next time. Yeah, right now, no, no, no. we're going to make them I bring think in. it's quackers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, Steve, you went through uh, both administrative actions, right? Yes. Right. Um, Beth Warren, are you, are you with us? I am. You are. There you are. Take it away. Sure. Hi. Um, we're seeking authorization to enter into a contract with Saks Communication, Inc. for consulting services relating to the 2015 statewide MWBE form and authorization to take related actions. Saks Communication is a New York City-based certified WBE firm. We're looking to engage Saks for the full service project management services related to event management, marketing, pre-event and on-site registration for the 2015 MWBE form scheduled for October 1st and 2nd in Albany. This is our fourth such statewide event, which has in, previ which has in previous events attracted over 2,000 participants and attendees, including Governor Cuomo, state agencies and authorities, NWBE firms, and vendors. This is New York State's premier event, providing a variety of panel presentations on issues important to MWBEs, as well as opportunities to learn about New York State procurement and contracting opportunities. We look to utilize ESD's discretionary purchasing authority to enter into this contract, the term of which is, expect is expected to be nine months with a consultant fee of $111,300 under the $200,000 threshold for MWBE discretionary purchase procurements. The consultant will also be responsible for hiring vendors and service providers as necessary to execute the event. Those costs include reimbursable, reimbursable expenses estimated at $161,950 and 68 cents. Uh, the total is not to exceed the contract amount is $273,250.68. The source of the funding for the contract will be through revenue earned from the 2015 state, statewide MWB forum event. Costs are paid by registration fees, exhibitor fees, and sponsorship from other agencies. The executive chamber directs the entire event and projected gross income for the 2015 MWB form is expected to be $400,000 with a net income of at least $100,000. This would be the third year SACS uh, would be engaged to manage this event, and we are seeking a direct procurement. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan Petroff on the New York Works Task Force. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this item is a request for authorization to reimburse the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey $125,000 for expenses incurred on behalf of the New York Works Task Force. Uh, the state has appropriated <coughs> funds for services and expenses associated with the task force and those funds have been made available to ESD to support the work of the task force. The New York Works Task Force was launched by Governor Cuomo and the legislature in the spring of 2012 to help improve the state's planning, delivery, and financing of capital investments. The Port Authority was included as one of the entities on the task force's implementation council. <coughs> and the Port Authority assisted the task force by, among other things, retaining the services of Navigant Consulting to help the task force prepare its first legislatively mandated report. Uh, working closely with the task force and its staff, Navigant was assisted, uh, assisted with the drafting of the task force's September 2012 report. The task force reviewed and adopted the report and delivered it to the governor and the legislature. Uh, additional information, including copies of the report and the transmittal letter, are set out in the board materials, and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dan. Our I just have uh, brief yeah. questions. Um, who is in charge of the task force these days? Um, I believe responsibility for New York Works has been passed to Karen Ray. And where is she located? She's uh, now with Empire State ESD. Development. ESD. ESD. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Aaron, our, you have our fifth administrative item on Cuba. Good afternoon. I am pleased to report that Global New York organized a successful trade mission to Cuba in April, the first state-led trade mission to Cuba since President Obama's call to normalize ties between the two countries. A proactive trade strategy is a main pillar of Global New York, an Empire State Development program that aims to create and retain jobs in New York State by attracting foreign direct investment and helping New York companies export products and services abroad. Trade missions are pivotal to the Global New York strategy, and as such, the Cuba trade mission enabled New York State to gain first mover advantage and help position New York State companies when the federal trade embargo is lifted. It also expanded trade opportunities for industries that are currently exempted from the embargo. Led by Governor Cuomo and ESD President CEO Howard Zemsky, the trade mission is already producing meaningful results. During the trip, three agreements were reached. 
SUNY shared a framework for an MOU with the University of Havana that will expand SUNY's study abroad pro program to Cuba and increase scholarly exchanges. INFOR reached a deal to train Cuban students and sell, sell its healthcare management software to Cuban companies. And Roswell Park Cancer Institute finalized an agreement with the Center for Molecular Immunology to develop a lung cancer vaccine and begin clinical trials in the United States, which could, which could commence within a year. And soon after returning from the trade mission, JetBlue announced that it would inaugurate a direct flight weekly from JFK Airport to Havana beginning on July 3rd. Many of the other participating companies and institutions are continuing direct dialogue and are working with Global New York on potential agreements that may still emerge. In addition to New York State gaining a foothold in the Cuban market, the trade mission has positioned ESD as a resource. Global New York has fielded numerous inquiries from companies, as well as other states, interested in entering the Cuban market, and is also serving as a resource to the U.S. Departments of Commerce and Treasury. In Cuba, for subsequent trade missions and hosts, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be replicating the programmatic format <coughs> Global New York implemented. And in New York State, companies are already inquiring about the possibility of participating in the next trade mission. Considerable logistical challenges accompany the trade mission to Cuba, which lacks a full communications infrastructure, has limited travel options, and where U.S. business has not been conducted freely in more than 50 years. Still, at a cost of $83,013, $83, an additional $25,000 to retain the services of a Cuba expert consultant, Global New York delivered a time and cost efficient trade mission that will produce economic benefits to New York State for years to come. An itemized expense report has been attached, and the directors are requested to ratify the actions taken and the expenses incurred in connection with the Global New York Trade Mission to Cuba. Thanks, Aaron. The final administrative item is going to be presented by Edmund Lee. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, in accordance with the public authorities law, every year ESD is required to re-examine its mission statement and related performance measurements. The board previously re-examined and approved the mission statement in August 2014. Today, the directors are requested to accept the fiscal year 2014-15 performance measurement report in accordance with the public authorities' law. Using the performance measurement report, I'm, I'm sorry, using the performance report measurements listed in your cover memo, the uh, attached report, which was uh, put together by uh, Sharice Liggins and Brendan Healy, along with some uh, input from Bren Benson Martin. Uh, shows ESD approvals for loans and grants in fiscal year 2014-15. As you can see, ESD had a very busy year. Um, the first chart in your material summarizes activity that occurred through our traditional discretionary programs compared to what was accomplished through the regional councils. The second chart is a straightforward and, and summarizes funding by region, and the third chart shows the data divided by industry. As a high-level summary, a total of 231 companies and organizations were assisted during the last fiscal year. As a result, the ESD grant and loan assistance, as a result of this ESD grant and loan assistance, a total of $1.77 billion of total investment was made in New York State, which includes ESD grant and loan investments of $523 million, other public investment of $239 million, and private investment of $1 billion. This assistance is anticipated to retain 17,686 jobs and create 4,498 jobs. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Edwin. Well, we, rev we have reviewed six administrative items. Do the directors have any questions or comments on the six administrative items that were just reviewed? Thank you. You mentioned that SAS has been uh, the vendor for the past three years. Is there any, um, has the item been put out to, to bid every year or? I believe, um, is Carlos here? No. I believe Carlos it was, here. Carlos is here. oh, Carlos is here. I believe it was put out to bid three mm -hmm. years ago. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. The original contract was uh, three years ago. Last year, we awarded the contract on a single source basis uh, based on the discretionary <coughs> threshold of $200,000 for Dude, are there any other questions or comments from the directors on the six administrative items? Yes, please. Yeah, I just have a question on the Cuba mission. When I appreciate its success, but my question is simply in terms of the responsibility of the board 
and the fact that the budget for this is coming to us after the trip has already taken place i just want to note that um, i see that as somewhat problematic is there a reason why it came to us after the trip rather than before i think that in the situation with cuba it was a very unique situation and um, just based on the nature of the relationship between the u.s and cuba there was a there were many um, blind spots in planning the trade mission that it was nearly impossible to come up with a budget that we thought would be an accurate um, portrayal of what we, we could actualize. Okay. And there's no budget line for trips of this nature in general? Uh, I think... This has to be done as a separate uh, item. I think moving forward, we have um, a better idea with other countries that we plan to uh, lead trade missions to. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Any comments from the public? Is there a motion to approve these six administrative items? Yes. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, First time in years. Victoria Theater <laughs> Redevelopment, Tom Connesson. <coughs> the directors are being requested to approve the conditional designation of the Apollo Theater Foundation as operator and manager right. of the cultural arts component of the Victoria Theater Land Use Improvement and Civic Project to enter into a lease operating agreement and to take related actions. In January, ESD and HCDC issued an RFP to operate and manage 25,000 square feet of cultural space that will be owned by HCDC at the Victoria Theater Project. Uh, and received a very compelling uh, response from the Apollo Theater Foundation that staff are recommending today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, Tawanda? Good afternoon. I'll be reviewing the annual and quarterly reports on utilization of certified minority women-owned business enterprises and procurement commitments to M MWBs for fiscal year 2014 through 2015, and I'll begin with the annual. Disbursements on pre-2014-2015 procurements and amendments, ESD dispersed a total of $640.9 million during the entire 2014 through 15 fiscal year. Of that amount, approximately $347.6 million was directly related to procurements and amendments executed on or prior to March 31st, 2014. Utilization of certified MWBEs of ESD's total disbursements for fiscal year 2014 through 2015, approximately $123.3 million was paid to MWBE firms. The agency achieved MWBE participation of 19.2% for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2014. The agency is 23% for the fiscal year. In the two previous fiscal years, the agency achieved 19.6% and 26.6% respectively. <coughs> the decline in the last fiscal year was attributed to $100 million in advance payments made to the Buffalo Billion Initiative. With respect to initial commitments of certified MWBs, ESD and its subsidiaries executed $132 million in procurements and amendments, of which $117.1 million were MWBE eligible procurements. Of the eligible procurements, ESD, its subsidiaries, and prime vendors committed $4.5 million or 3.8% to MWBE firms. In the prior fiscal year, MWBE firms received initial commitments totaling 7.8%. Moving on to the quarterly report, utilization of certified MWBEs during the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2014 through 2015. ESD achieved MWBE <coughs> participation in agency projects and procurement totaling 42.8% and dispersed $86.7 million in eligible procurements to vendors, grantees, and borrowers during the fourth quarter. Of that amount, $37.1 million in payments were made to MWBEs. Initial commitments to certify MWBs. ESD and its subsidiaries ex executed $18.6 million in procurements and amendments. Of that amount, $5.68 million were MWBE eligible procurements. Of the eligible procurements, $438,000 or 7.7% was committed to MWBEs. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
I don't know if we have any other. Yeah, we should go back and vote actually on Tom's issue. That needs a. Um, are there any questions or comments with respect to Victoria Theater? From the directors, any comments from the public? Keep moving forward on that. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, the items that were presented by Tawanda and Simone are FYI, but not requiring any votes. What? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, this will be really quick. <laughs> um, this is just an informational item. There's no requirement for the board to vote. On December 19, 2014, the ESD directors approved a general project plan authorizing a grant totaling 150000 to Ephesus Technologies, LLC, for a portion of the cost of machinery and equipment purchased at the grantee's LED lighting manufacturing facility in Syracuse. <coughs> Total costs were expected to be approximately $585,203. In September 2014, the company completed the project. A public hearing on the general project plan was held on January 13, 2015, at which no negative comment was received. To facilitate management of project funding and administrative responsibilities, the grantee has requested that the grant be made directly to its sister company, Ephesus Lighting, Inc., who will incur expenses for the project and is committed to achieving the employment goals and reporting requirements specified in the grant terms and conditions. No other change to the grant terms are proposed because of the project scope budget and the party's function with respect to the project remain as described. Staff will accommodate the request for a change of grantee as an administrative matter. Um, no further authorization is required. Thank you. Great. Are there any questions? We don't need a vote. Are there any questions for Tawanda or Simone at all? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, may I have a motion to conduct an executive session pursuant to paragraphs D and F of section 105 of the New York State Open Meetings Law? Specifically, we will discuss and consider authorizing ESD to enter into a settlement agreement in connection with Vincent versus HCDC. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we are in executive session. Yeah,